always wanted to share this story, but I've never done it before, so here goes. This is a story from long ago, before crawlers were a thing that people talked about that much, before the internet exploded, and that annoying modem sound came on if you were lucky enough to have a computer and an internet connection. It was around 1999, and I was living in very rural upstate New York. If you don't know, or you've never been to the area of the Catskill Mountains, it's small town after small town, surrounded by forests and farmlands. Not much to do back then, but hang out with your friends and drive around. At least, that's what I did with my friends, besides the weekly house party. My best friend and I were very into the paranormal back then, and we both experienced many unexplained things our entire lives. Being in our late teens, young adulthood, we just decided we were curious, and at the time, we also both identified as Wiccan. We spent a lot of time in those woods. We would meditate, do earthy spells, have lunch, and camp out. So, needless to say, we were not afraid of the woods, the dark, or being completely isolated in the middle of nowhere. One night, on one of our late winter drives to nowhere, we ended up on a road that we hadn't really been on before. We pulled off on the side to where this old schoolhouse was. We parked the car, got out, and looked in the windows to check it out and see what was inside. It appeared to be kept up as a historical site. There were old desks inside, and old chalkboards, things like that. It was really neat, but we did have that creepy feeling that you get at places where the veil is thin. So, of course, we returned there several times after. We were just drawn to the place. A few times, we went during the day with some other girlfriends to check it out. As we took a walk in the woods behind the schoolhouse, we all felt this odd feeling. The only way we could really describe it was like what I've heard of as walking through a fairy circle. The ambient lighting around us felt different. I can't really describe it other than almost more of a vivid color experience around us as the sun came through the trees. We didn't think we were there all that long, maybe an hour. But when we returned to the car, it had been several hours and it was early evening, maybe around 5 or 6 p.m., and we'd gotten there at noon. One of my best friends and I went at night again. We were sitting in the car, just talking, drinking our gas station bought cappuccino purchased for our night drive, and we kept hearing this tap, tap, tap sound. Out loud, I said, knock it off, to the nothing that was there. Right as I say this, we hear what we could only describe as children's feet running away from behind to the side of the car. That little pitter-patter that only kids can make. It freaked us both out and we got the heck out of there. There was no way that anyone was there. Like I said, this was a rural main road to a dirt road pull-off. Completely pitch black. No street lights. No cars going by in the distance or anything. If someone did show up, they would have been walking in the dark for miles to get there. And it certainly wouldn't be a child. It's kind of sad when I think about it now. I certainly hope it wasn't a roaming spirit of a child, gone too soon from this place. Anyway, that's where the freakiest part happens. And we never did return to that old school after this. As we're getting back onto the main road, there in the headlights, we saw something scurry across the road quickly. It looked like a hairless, naked human, crawling low to the ground, its elbows bent so high that its belly was close to the road, like a grasshopper, and its knees looked like they were bent backwards. I remember us both turning to look at each other with that panicked look on our faces. We then said, what the heck was that? Did you just see that? What the heck was that? We drove home kind of trembling and not saying a whole lot. I remember I kept looking in the rear view mirror, half expecting to see this thing chasing us down the road. Luckily, we did not. 
My friends and I are still best friends to this day, and we sometimes talk about this series of events. Years later, we saw the movie The Descent, and it immediately made us both think of that old schoolhouse and the thing that we saw run across the road that night. It was a freaky place, experience, and time. Also exciting and slightly terrifying. I now live across the country, far away from New York, but I often wonder about that old schoolhouse and those woods. Someday, I think I would like to return, now that I'm older and in a different place in my life. I would like to see if it's still there, and just see how I feel about all of it now. But I would never, ever want to see that thing that we saw so many years ago. When I was about six years old, I woke up during the night and made eye contact with a strange humanoid creature. It was looking at me through my bedroom window. My room was ground level and my bed was facing the window. Strangely, I remember choosing to leave my curtains open that night for the first time ever. So whatever this thing was, was in full view. When I initially saw it, I was completely dumbfounded and couldn't believe my eyes. I shook my head no, as I was thinking that this couldn't really be happening. I pinched myself to make sure that I wasn't dreaming. Then the creature frowned. I nodded my head yes, and the creature smiled. Again I shook my head no, and it frowned. So I nodded, and once again it smiled. I may have repeated this a few more times. Whatever it was seemed to be almost greenish in color and had a roundish face. Kind of like Yoda. I can't remember all of the details, but I distinctly remember telling myself that this was really happening and not to allow myself to chalk it up later to being a dream. I kept telling myself over and over, this was real, this was not a dream. This was real. I still have no idea what that thing was. I just talked to my buddy tonight on the phone for a few minutes. While we were talking, I asked him where he was. He said he was in the desert of Arizona at that exact moment. Just for the heck of it, I asked him if he had seen any weird UFOs out on those open highways driving at night. And this was his reply. No, I haven't seen anything like that. But about three months ago, I was out here driving and it was late at night. I was in the desert. I noticed something on the side of the road. At first, I thought it was somebody wearing a raincoat. It was about five feet tall, shaped like a human, and was black. As I got closer to it, it spread out wings, and then went straight up into the air. It didn't flap its wings, or anything like that. It just went straight up and out of sight, very quickly. I was like, wow, no kidding. He said he thought about it, and then told me maybe it was a condor. But I was like, no man, those kinds of birds have to get a running start, and it takes them a few feet to even get off the ground. It's too bad he didn't get a better look at what he was actually seeing before it took off. As we were talking, his signal started to go in and out, so I let him go. I'm going to try to talk to him this weekend when he's back home, and see what else he's experienced. But, yeah, apparently he saw a humanoid. He's a trucker, so he gets to go all over, and I'm sure he's seen some other things as well. I can't wait to find out the rest of his story. So 
Somewhere around 2013 or 2014, I was leading my sister, who was then about 15 or 16, to a forest that I would sometimes go to with a friend. The way it was set up is there was this giant ditch or valley that had a bunch of water in the bottom. So if you fell, you could easily get injured or drown from the size of it. The ditch went in a straight line in front of the forest, and there was this little concrete dam type thing that you could walk on to get across to the forest. It's nighttime, and I've never been there at night. My sister wanted a place to smoke cigarettes, so we walked there with one of her other friends who was like 17 or 18. As we got up to the dam, we all see this five to seven foot tall person type thing. And as soon as it sees us, it starts jumping towards us, about four feet in the air. Its movement was a little clumsy, if I can remember right. When it started jumping, we all ran as quickly as we could and went back home. It was shaped like a human, but its legs looked like a goat. It almost looked like it was wearing a light gray jacket, but maybe it was fur. There was very little light, so it was hard to see well. We never told anybody about it because we were all underage. Told our parents that we were going to church, didn't tell them we were gonna wander around. So we didn't wanna get in trouble. I don't think there was some Olympic jumper out there doing weird stuff in the forest either. The forest has signs all around it saying to stay out, so I don't think people would really do that. One time after my sister turned 18, I texted her about it. She said that she remembers the thing being all black, so either one of us might be right. I'm not really sure what we saw. I know that there have been Goatman sightings out in that area for decades, so maybe that was it. If you have any ideas, let me know. I'm an outdoorsman. I'm very experienced in hunting, camping, hiking, and general survival. I'm very familiar with and used to wildlife, and I was charged by what I believe was a cryptid called a dogman. It charged both my cousin and I. It was not a bear. A bear cannot move how this thing did. And it wasn't a normal wolf, as they can't comfortably run on two legs whereas what charged us seemed natural at doing that. This happened around June or July of 2007. I was around 17 years old and a lot more cocky then, but I still was somewhat knowledgeable of the outdoors. My family used to own a cabin in Northwest Wisconsin. I basically grew up there in the summer. I knew the woods well, but at night it was wise to stay in the cabin or at least by the bonfire at the beach because of bears, wolves, and cougars. One of the creepiest things was if you were having a bonfire, the tree line was visible from the fire pit and the beach, and at night, you always felt like you were being watched from that tree line. But during the day, the woods always seemed normal, not so creepy at all. That is, until this incident. So this happened somewhere between noon and four o'clock. My cousin and I were having an airsoft battle. I was in full woodland camo. He was not. I retreated onto the ATV trail into the woods for a tactical advantage, and our battle took us about 200 meters in to about a third of the way up the trail. We had enough at this point and were standing at the edge of a clearing on the trail, just talking, and he was maybe 10 feet from me when I decided to mess with him. I shushed him and said, were being watched. He froze. But then I realized that the woods were dead quiet, and I got spooked. At that point, it wasn't so much of a joke. I started to scan the tree line and the other edge of the clearing from left to right when I saw it. Its teeth gave it away. It was panting and staring at my cousin. I don't expect you to believe me, but what I saw was a wolf-type creature as big as a black bear, at least 300 pounds, but it wasn't normal. This wolf was on two legs, 
crouching next to a tree with its arm grasping the tree, grasping with a clawed hand. It had reddish-brown fur. I told my cousin, we have to go, and the next thing I know, he's sprinting. I looked back at Wolfie, who had locked on and sprinted a few steps on two feet. Then I turned and ran as fast as I could. Right before I turned, it looked like Wolfie was dropping onto all fours. It charged us, and it sounded like it was right on our asses as we barreled through the brush. But for whatever reason, it let us go when we broke out of the tree line and headed for the cabin. What stuck with me the most was the sheer size of this thing. Wolfie appeared to be about seven feet tall when upright, and that where it should have had front paws, it appeared to have large, clawed hands. Now I'm not sure how to explain this away rationally. I've heard wolves will occasionally kind of walk upright, but as far as I know, they only go a couple of steps, and they certainly can't sprint on two legs. Nor do wolves get that big, and black bears sort of waddle on two legs so it couldn't have been either of those creatures. The closest description, as silly as it sounds, is a werewolf or a dogman. This happened to myself, my little brother, and my cousin when I was about 14 years old. It was just around dusk. We all lived in Tampico, Tamaulipas, Mexico. We decided to go play basketball at the outside courts. It was still daylight when we first got there, and we usually start heading home at about dusk or when the court lights come on. It was only a few blocks away from our grandma's house. When the lights come on, that's usually when the bigger kids get to the court to play. But this time we were fortunate enough to have the whole court to ourselves. We were shooting hoops like normal, nothing out of the ordinary, and the lights came on. But since we had the place to ourselves and we were having so much fun, we kept playing. The game was 21, so two of us would stand to the side of the hoop, depending on which direction the ball would go, so that it wouldn't roll into the street. And on one of these shots that my cousin made, the ball just missed the hoop and bounced behind it. I managed to grab it before leaving the court when I saw a strange creature. It was like a little person, no bigger than two feet. It had the face of a very old man with a fairly large nose, old ragged clothes that looked like they were handmade, and a hat that, I swear, looks like something a garden gnome would wear. You know, it was one of those pointy hats, but it wasn't straight up, it sort of hanged down to the side. It was crouched down, almost like it was in hiding, and when I got too close to it, that's when it stood up, looked at me, and then ran away from me. Believe me, my first thought was not to chase it. I was scared stiff, but my cousin and little brother saw it too, and they ran. When it ran, it was headed for the other side of the court. I couldn't believe the speed of this thing. I mean, for it to be so small, it made it to the other side in mere seconds, almost the blink of an eye. It ran behind the post and was gone. I snapped out of it and I started to run home as well. And as I ran past that same post that this thing ran behind, I turned to look to see if it was there, but it was gone. When I got home, my little brother and cousin had already told the adults there what had happened. They didn't tell us we were crazy. In fact, they told us that these little creatures are called duendes. Apparently, there are different types of them too. So, I guess they're sort of a widely known creature where I live. I had never heard about them growing up, but that was my experience. You can believe me or not, but... I hope you enjoyed the story either way. I had a rather odd encounter with some humanoid creature, or even a spirit possibly, just a few nights ago. 
I haven't been able to come up with a rational answer as to just what I saw. It happened just a few nights ago. I was biking home from work. I work the closing shifts for my local Walgreens, so I get off work around 10.30. I live only a half hour away by bike from my job, but most of the way home is by a heavily forested trail, which doesn't have very many street lights. It's always pitch black when I'm on my way home. I'm about five minutes into this bike ride, and I hit the beginning of where the street lights end and the darkness begins. As I always do, I pulled out my phone and turned on the flashlight option so I could see. Only a few seconds after I turned it on, I tilted it up more and froze. I saw this tall, skinny, pale-looking figure for just a brief second before it fell onto all fours and, just like the wind, was gone into the woods. Shortly after, I started to pedal as fast as I could because I had no clue what I had seen and I didn't want to be in the same woods as it was. That's when I heard a low screech. Whatever it was was keeping pace with me, hidden in the woods out of sight. I managed to get out of that area very quickly, and I didn't see or hear anything after I left that heavily wooded area. But a while later on, I caught scent of what literally smelled like fresh blueberry pancakes or waffles. It was like somebody was standing out in the field with a hot plate of just the pan of blueberry pancakes, which it didn't make any sense to me. There are no buildings or shops in the area where that scent came from. I figured that perhaps whatever it was I had seen was using the scent to try to draw me back into the woods. Now, I do know a few areas around that trail are supposedly haunted. There's a dinner theater that's not too far from it and a supposedly haunted water tower in the area as well, and a few other places. But still, no matter what I can think of, I can't rationalize it or debunk it as something else. It couldn't have been a deer, because I've talked to people around the area, and no one has seen a deer in the area ever. Besides, it was standing on two feet when I first saw it, like a human. It couldn't have been any other wildlife, because the only wildlife I've ever spotted there are squirrels and birds, but I figured I would share my experience and see if anybody else has had something similar happen, or see if anybody knows what it is I saw. This happened when I was about seven years old to my uncle. He's no longer with us, and I wanted to share his story. Growing up, I lived in northern Michigan on 5,000 acres of farm and ranch land that backed up into state land. Nothing but miles of forest and pasture could be seen. Needless to say, it made us pretty tough, and it takes a lot to spook us. We're all avid hunters, fishermen, and outdoorsmen. Being the only girl, I was raised as a tomboy, and I'm just the same. My uncle went off to join the military, becoming a senior NCO in a prominent Special Forces division of the U.S. Navy. He was 6'4", built like a wrestler, obviously skilled in survival tactics, and nothing rattled him. He was home on leave and went out hunting as it was deer season. I remember him coming in the house, shaking and crying, saying that he saw something in the woods. My uncle never cried. He was tough as nails and would tear someone to shreds before he let them make him cry. My grandmother tried to get him to make sense, but he kept saying that he saw Bigfoot mixed with the wolf. My granny immediately got my grandfather and he rounded up the rest of the guys. The hunting squad went out, which was my dad, a few male cousins, my uncle who was still terrified but didn't want to be labeled a chicken, and a couple of other guys. They all got their shotguns and ammunition and saddled the horses to go clear the woods. Apparently, they were aware of the dogman, but I was blissfully young and ignorant. They told me to stay inside, and said that for absolutely no reason was I to step outside of our house until they returned. I had never heard my dad or grandfather so serious, so I hid in my room. Sunset comes, and they still aren't back. 
I'm really worried at this point, because they've never stayed in the woods after dark. Shortly, I heard the sound of the horses running to the barn and their voices. I was so relieved. They looked troubled when they came into the house, but didn't say anything, probably not to spook me. At dinner, my dad laid down the law that I was no longer allowed to play outside or go to the barns alone. I had to have my grandfather with me at all times. Of course, I was pretty upset by this and felt that my independence was being taken away, but I obeyed. The next morning, my dad and grandfather taught me how to shoot. That's when I knew it was serious. I overheard the adults talking the next night. Apparently, there were tracks where my uncle had his sighting bigger than any wolf could make, but definitely not dog tracks. As I said before, we're all avid outdoorsmen, and we can definitely identify tracks. My family has identified the tracks of just about every animal in that area, and some outside of it, but these couldn't be identified. About eight feet up in a tree were claw marks. No Michigan bear could make those. We also found claw marks of about the same height on multiple trees throughout the property. There were cattle mutilated and not in any way that a coyote or bear would, and it lasted the whole winter. We lost about 30 to 40 cattle that winter, all of them mutilated, all with the same wolf dog tracks in the snow. I really feel like this experience changed my uncle. Who knows, he did multiple tours in the Middle East for Desert Storm and Operation Iraqi Freedom before unfortunately finally taking his own life. After that experience, though, he was never the same. He never touched alcohol before this. But after this, I never saw him without a bottle of Jack in his hand, and his eyes were always haunted. He changed his personality. He never even went out in the woods again. He quit hunting, and he eventually just quit coming home to visit on leave. He didn't even come home for my dad's funeral two years later. It was heartbreaking to see him deteriorate the way he did. I truly believe that he saw something out there, and while he might have gotten away that day, it ultimately killed him. We're from a small town in southern Ohio, about an hour east of Cincinnati. This town has been plagued with people dying young, and some in pretty gruesome ways. Google Cheryl Fossil as an example. Many believe that this is caused by activity around the area, or that it's the cause of the activity. There's a section of woods that seems to have concentrated activity, though. The woods in question are surrounded by two churches, a hospital, and an area of housing. Now, as full disclosure, things don't happen every time we go in. But when things do happen, they happen off the charts. The most common things that we've experienced are what we've dubbed the geeks. We call these things geeks because they're tall, sometimes 12 feet from toe to crown, and gangly. They move awkwardly, although they move between trees swiftly. They never present themselves outwardly, only glimpses of them as they move between trees. The scariest thing about them, however, is the sound right before they start moving. It's almost like a deep groan. The second that I want to talk about is Hydra. Only one of us have ever seen this thing, and so far has been the only one witnessed. It's like a small primate creature, with the face of a hideous woman, the body of a chimpanzee, and long greasy black hair with boils on its back, blood red boils. The member of our group who had encountered this thing refused to tell us what Hydra spoke to him about. These are some of the things that we've encountered. We're working on a documentary about what's going on in this area and the town itself. I'll keep everybody who's interested updated, but I really hope that somebody else has had similar experiences. 
We would love to find out what's going on in the woods. After she had surgery for her kidney stones, my grandma became more sensitive about things. Exactly after the surgery, while she was still in the hospital, we both met in our dreams. She's seen me in her dream, and I've seen her in my similar dream on the same night. There's a lot to say about that too, but that's a story for another day. About a half a year later, she kept mentioning the little ugly people coming out of this particular flower pot in her apartment. According to her, they would come out during the nighttime or very early in the morning, just rising from the flower pot, walking a little bit around the room, and then going back into the flower pot and decreasing in size until the flower pot would swallow them. Bear in mind, this happened around 10 years ago. She told the entire family, and even though my mom and I are believers of the paranormal, we thought it might be age that was speaking in this case. Maybe she was hallucinating. Maybe it was sleep paralysis. But no, she kept insisting and insisting that she sees them every night. Then she kept giving us details. We suggested she might be dreaming, and she would respond that she would get up and turn on the lights every time. They seemed to wake her up almost every night. On some nights, she would go to my grandpa in his bedroom. They were sleeping separately because they enjoyed the solitude and comfort. And she would wake him up and say, they're back. By the time my grandpa would come into her room, nothing was there. One night, she called my mom to say that they've woken her up again. She gave us a lot of details about these creatures. That they were small, but quite ugly. That's why she named them the Little Ugly People. They were maximum one meter in height. They were weirdly dressed. Later on, she described them better, and I came to the conclusion that the fashion style would be around the 1800s. They also had hats. They were both male and female, and it was only one of them coming out per night, never more of them, even though I do refer to them as plural. It seemed that they were struggling a bit to get out of the flower pot, and by implication, the flower, which was just a normal apartment plant. She tried to communicate with them every time, but with no success. They never hurt her, and they weren't doing anything to the objects in the room. They walked around the room, sometimes going to a different flower pot and disappearing there. There were times when she lost it and started screaming at them, and telling them to leave her alone. One time she said she woke up and looked around and there was a tiny creature staring at her. Most of the time they were staring at her. Also, some of them had beards. We've searched for a very long time for any kind of reasonable explanation. Then we started to believe her and we searched for a paranormal one. I posted on a paranormal forum many, many years ago and the answer I received was that they were gnomes visiting my grandma, and that she should not interact with them, as they might get aggressive and dangerous. They suggested putting rocks in a circle around the flower pot, and we did. I don't recall any other suggestion. This went on for more than a year. After about six months of quiet after we put the stones out, she started to forget things. Soon after, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, which she bravely battled for another two to three years. She's no longer with us, and I miss her, but sometimes I still meet her in my dreams. We started to think that maybe, since she ultimately was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, she was hallucinating. But that doesn't explain why after we put the stones out, it stopped happening, unless it was power of suggestion. Whether it was something medical or paranormal, it was still a really bizarre thing, and I'll never forget it.
One of the more curious paranormal incidents in Georgia is the Georgia werewolf, Emily Isabella Burt. Apparently, Miss Burt was a resident of Talbot County, a rural county in southwest Georgia, between Macon and Columbus. The Burt family, a wealthy and prominent family in the Talbot County community, had several children. Of all of her children, it appears that Emily Isabella was the one with the most problems. For one, she had inherited a lot of physical traits from her father, including dark hair and bushy eyebrows. However, she was said to have had sharp, white canine teeth that made her smile quite disturbing. In one report, Roberts claims that Emily Isabella's mother took her to a local dentist to see if the teeth could be altered in any way, but he could do nothing for her. Soon afterward, she felt ill and suffered from restless nights. Emily is said to have strangely wandered the country during her restless nights. Legend has it that the beau of one of Emily Isabella's sisters, a William Gorman, reported to the birds that something was killing his sheep. Fearful that this may soon be happening to her animals, Mrs. Mildred Burt became quite concerned. On ensuing visits, Gorman would recount stories about more sheep killings and that some of his cattle were killed as well. He was concerned about the killings and decided to take action. He reported that he was going to be putting together what amounted to a posse. Their intentions were to shoot and kill whatever beast was doing the damage. Emily Isabella was unusually interested in what was going on and what events had transgressed in the hunt for this animal. On the night of the big hunt, Mildred Burt, who had also inherited more than a few guns and was a great markswoman, went out with her pistol. She apparently suspected that Emily Isabella was somehow involved with the killings and she wanted to be prepared for anything. As she was near the area, an animal lunged for her, and she fired. It ran away. Interestingly enough, the next morning it was reported that Emily Isabella had a bullet hole in her left hand. After being taken to a local physician, her mother decided to send her to Paris to be treated by a doctor who specialized in lycanthropy, a disorder that makes its victims think that they're werewolves. While she was in Paris, the attacks at home stopped, and, once she returned, supposedly cured, the attacks fell to a minimum. Emily died in 1911, and is buried in a small cemetery out in the wilderness of Georgia. To this day, a number of paranormal incidents are reported in that area, with the grave itself generally believed to be haunted by the ghost of the werewolf. People report a strange stillness or a sense of unease around the cemetery, and the grave itself is strangely well kept, even though the cemetery is overgrown and forgotten. Others have reported that when small tokens, like a chip of stone, are taken from the cemetery, bad things happen to those people not long afterward. There are even some people who note that even just speaking poorly of Emily or her family causes the same problems to happen, as if the werewolf does not want anybody to speak ill of her. Last night, I woke up at around 2 a.m. I heard this soft yelling and was confused at first as to why somebody was out. Then, as I listened more, I realized there was a pattern to it. I wanted to get up to the window and see who was making that sound, thinking that they may just be a drunk person walking around the parking lot. But there was this overwhelming sense of dread that came over me, like if I looked outside, I would be drawn to go outside and if I went outside, I would never come back. This rhythmic whooping continued on for easily 20 minutes, 
and then stopped altogether. It was not an animal. I know this for sure. I've had paranormal experiences before, so maybe I'm easily spooked, but I think I was being lured outside. And even though it sounded human, I didn't get up to look. Now it's the morning after and I can't shake this feeling. Does this sound familiar to anyone else? Some kind of hunting practice for a known humanoid or cryptid? As a note, I live in an area of owls and wild birds and I hear them consistently throughout the week. I know what they sound like. I don't have coyotes or any big cats in my area. I listen to owls outside my window often and I can tell you that this was something different. I don't know how to explain it, but it almost sounded like a human trying to imitate an owl. I only immediately dismissed it as being a wild animal because it was so unlike anything I've ever heard. I would love to know what it could be. As a kid, maybe 11 years old, I was once in the forest looking for lost things. Then I came across a small pond, really a small pool in the forest. A woman was standing in the water. The water reached her knees. She was looking to the other direction and I couldn't see her face. She had white hair and some old looking clothes. They looked extremely old fashioned. She didn't turn to me and she didn't move at all but I could see her breathing. I came closer and then she left the water and stood on the forest ground. As she was raising her feet from the water, I saw that her feet were backwards. I was shocked, frozen, but I freaked out and finally turned around and began to run. As I was running, I looked back and I could see her face. She was looking at me with this evil grin and an extremely pale face. I went home and told the story to my parents and of course they did not believe me. I've never forgotten this encounter and I was wondering if anybody else had any accounts of people having backwards feet. I went to this forest multiple times afterwards with my friends, never alone again, but I couldn't even find the pond, let alone the woman anymore. The closest thing I've found on the internet is the saguapa. As soon as I saw a picture of one, it gave me chills. The woman I saw looked exactly the same, but she was extremely pale. Everything else looks the same though. I'm fairly certain that this is what I saw, but I'm also open to any other ideas. It was around 10 o'clock at night, off a little ways from Ocean City, Maryland. It was mother, her boyfriend, my sister, and I. We were driving home from our vacation and I asked if we could take the back roads. I always loved seeing the woods at night and it was the scenic route. We were driving down and although I was the one who asked for the trees, I was on my phone texting and listening to music. We eventually came to a stretch of road that I didn't pay much attention to. It was boring, but I occasionally looked up every now and then as I'd had the entire ride. It was a straight path forward with nothing but street lights. So we were driving and driving and as we crossed under the lights, it was almost relaxing. I went into a half sleep trance. Then I suddenly woke up and everything was fine. More lights as we drove by. No one was talking. My mom's boyfriend wasn't asleep, but there were no muffled conversations. Everything seemed calm. But I had this sudden awareness. We were in the middle of the woods. It was dark and around 1130 to midnight. And without the streetlights, you couldn't see anything but the stars. 
I immediately felt a very paranoid vibe and turned my phone on and listened to music. Then we entered back on another streetlight stretch and we drove on. The strange part is, it's almost like something told me to go on my phone, as if there was a notification, but I checked and nothing was there. When I did this though, I noticed something in my peripheral. There were about four lights up ahead that were turned off in an area where the road kind of turns. This was a fairly wooded area and you couldn't see much without light, so we slowed down. I didn't pay much attention to it, but this next part sticks with me. As we slowly approached the next light that was on, something crawled out from the woods and into the light. I looked up and thought it was a deer at first, but it kept moving out. It was limping, but when it was fully emerged, what I saw was truly bone chilling. A naked, ash white, skinny man crawled out on all fours. It stopped. And as I saw it, it turned its head toward us. Its eyes were a deep charcoal black. We sped up fast and started driving. It was not human. As we drove past it, it jumped over our car weightlessly, defying physics. My mom's Mercedes had two sunroofs, and although it was a blur, I got a close look at it. As it passed over the car, it landed behind us and faded into the black. The scary part was, when it jumped over our car, the sunroof was open. I'm glad we got out of there. It was the summer of 2010 and I was still in high school. My friend's dad invited me with his family to go camping near a lake that was a Native American reservation at one point. We get to the campsite and my friend and I start experiencing weird things. We got chased by a swarm of ghost bees and we just started to feel like it wasn't safe to be by ourselves. There was a shaman who was going to tell stories around his campsite, and he was inviting campers to come by that night and listen. When night came, I had to walk a ways to the public restroom at the campsite. I get to the restroom and a guy comes running out, screaming that there are hornets in the bathroom. I was scared of stinging bugs, so I decided to go in a bush that was about four yards away from the restroom. I start peeing and I start hearing rustling coming from the bush. I shine the flashlight and he has darkish skin with white face paint and he's almost half naked. I jumped back and I screamed and I scraped my elbow. A nearby camper ran over to help me and I told him that I saw a man crouched in the bushes. This dad-like figure shines his flashlight into the bush and dives into the bush. Now, all this happened in a matter of minutes. From me seeing the guy and screaming and the other guy coming to help me, I probably only looked away for a second, but when the guy jumped into the bush, he stands back up and he's holding a rabbit. The guy also found burning sage. He told me what sage was because I didn't even know what it was at the time. He put the rabbit down and told me it was just my imagination or that if I was being truthful, the guy ran away and I shouldn't go alone to the bathroom anymore. I go back to my campsite and my friend's dad asked me what took so long. I didn't tell him what happened. He then tells us that he wants all of us to go to the shaman's camp so we can hear the stories. So we go to the campsite and this guy was dressed to the nines. Headdress, necklace, feathers, white face paint. And no, he was not the guy in the bushes. The shaman was probably in his 40s, and he said that his father taught him everything he knows. He told us the history of the lake, and that it was his people's land, and that we took it from them. Literally being honest as can be, and not sugarcoating it for the kids. We killed them and turned their home into a lake, and that his ancestors' bones are in that lake. 
He then starts telling us about native legends, and he starts talking about skinwalking. He told us that some people in these tribes were so in tune with nature that they could take on the form of other animals, mainly coyotes or dogs, but they can shift into other animals too. I was starting to feel genuinely spooked, and after his whole get-together ended, I told him about what I saw in the bush. He grabbed me by the shoulder and took me to his trailer and told me to wait outside. He came out with a single red feather and looked at my elbow and told me that I was wounded in battle and that this feather will show the skinwalkers that they should respect me and they will leave me alone. I didn't know what to do, so I took the feather and as I walk away, he shouts, they don't show themselves to everyone. I slept pretty good that night and the rest of the time we stayed after I got that feather. But like the dumbass kid that I was, I didn't treat it with respect and I lost the feather not soon after I got back home. I wish I still had it. I'm not saying that skinwalkers exist, but the shaman seemed to take what I said really seriously and I wanted to share my experience. I actually overheard this on the news a few years back about a cryptid in Kentucky. It's a feline-like creature said to look like a mountain lion mixed with some sort of monstrosity. I didn't really think much about it until my friend, we'll call him Bran, told me what he saw when he was deer hunting. It was pretty late and he and his dad were about to pack up. They heard a low growl near them. His dad told him to get back up in the hunting perch. I'm not a hunter by any means, so don't crucify me for not knowing the correct lingo. Bran did and watched through his binoculars to watch for what had made the growl or for his dad to give him an all good. He watched for what he said might have been 10 to 15 minutes when movement caught his eye. He tried to get a better look when he saw the weird creature that I mentioned earlier. It scared him so badly that he froze. He thought it was just a mountain lion or a bobcat, but it had four eyes. His dad managed to distract it off by startling a nearby doe. It left, chasing its newfound prey. He and his dad waited until they couldn't hear it and then booked it back to their truck. He was pretty shaken up the whole week after. I felt bad for him. However, this wasn't his only run-in with a cryptid or a strange creature. Despite being underage, he still does a lot of dangerous or stupid things such as drinking and driving, smoking cigarettes, and other really dumb things. He's not shy about it either. Well, he'd been doing that first one, but wasn't totally drunk yet. And his best friend, we'll call him Dave, was taking a joy ride with him on some back roads, which aren't hard to find in our region. They were messing around, having a good time, blaring music, you know, teenager things. He was focusing on the road, listening to a story Dave was telling him, when he saw a strange, pale, humanoid, quadrupedal, fleshy creature with visible teeth and large black eyes run out onto the road, Bran hit his brakes and just barely missed it. It screeched at him and ran off into the woods on the other side of the road. Bran and Dave sat there trying to process what had happened and if what they both saw was real. They stopped drinking and went straight back to Dave's house where they proceeded to freak out. They told me this story too as I sat next to them in a couple of classes. Well, I asked them to describe the creature to me as I'm known for researching and collecting information on cryptids, urban legends, and monsters, and they felt I could help. After they gave me the description, I came up with a list of possible creatures and showed them art and quote, real pictures of them on Brand's phone. Once we got to Wendigo's, Skinwalkers, and the Rake, they showed clear signs of distress. I pulled up one of the well-known rake pictures and showed it to them. I thought Bran was going to have a heart attack. He yelled, that's it, it has to be, it's almost dead on. Dave scrolled through the related pictures and found a different photo and quietly showed both of us. 
Bran then fell silent. They both said that that was it. That was the creature they nearly hit. I told them that they had to be bullshitting me, because the rake is a creepypasta. I told them the story and what it's known for, and that they were not proven to be real and were in fact very likely fake. But they insisted that that's what they saw. They thanked me and asked me if there was a way to protect themselves if it came for them. I told them I didn't know, but fire was probably the best route if it actually was real. They haven't had any experiences since that I know of, but it did freak them and me out a good amount. I was glad I could help them, but now I'm terrified of the woods, more than I previously was, and I question more and more if these legends are just legends. I already believed in a few, but it's just terrifying to think that more of them could be real. I've told a story before about living in a flat where this thing that I called the Whistler always came by. I had other experiences in this flat too, and this one thing has to be the worst by far. It's hard to describe the sense of dread and fear that this thing gave off. It honestly felt like my life was at risk, and my whole body would scream to run. Anytime I would hear this thing, I was alone, which, of course, just made it all worse. One night, the dog was barking outside, so I got up and went out to look. As I was looking outside, the dog went back in and left me alone, standing in the dark next to the shed. I soon became aware of noises in the shed, but put it down to the wind. That is, until I moved closer, and I felt a strong sense of dread. I listened to the sound. It sounds like a person on all fours scuffling around. I heard it move toward the shed door, so I ran inside and slammed the door. I sat down and tried to tell myself that it was still just the wind. At first, the dread was going away, but then I could feel it building up again. It felt like it was trying to find a way in, moving back and forth along the walls of the house. Then, I suddenly felt it inside the apartment. It had gotten into the kitchen. I'm not quite sure how. The window, maybe. I could feel it getting slowly closer. I was too scared to look behind me into the kitchen, but I managed to jump up and slam the door. I hoped it would leave, and it did. After this, I would hear it sometimes, just scuffling around at night. The alley at the back was dark and smelly, so I assumed it liked it. Now this next bit is truly a fault on my own part. I really should have listened to my own gut feeling. It was months later. It was summer and therefore very warm, so I had the back door open. I was on my laptop and it had gotten dark. At some point, I turned the light on and sat back down. I sat facing the back door. My laptop screen stopped me from seeing the bottom half of the door. After a while, I started to hear movement outside and felt uneasy, but I told myself that it was nothing. Yep, I just sat there and told myself I was being stupid. But the feeling grew stronger and stronger, my whole body screaming at me to run. Then, our dog comes running downstairs, stops in the middle of the room, looks at me, and then goes to walk outside. The way she did this was just... odd. I pulled down my screen and watched her head toward the back door. As she walked out the back door, there was this thing. Some humanoid figure crouched down by the door. Its skin was dark brown, like dirt and rot, and had texture like it'd been burned. It was hairless and skinny, like it hadn't eaten in months. There it was, this thing I had been in fear of for so long, right up against the door frame, trying to make its way inside. The figure twisted its emaciated form round to follow our dog. It was crouched down onto its hands and feet. That's why it was making the scuffling noise. 
I jumped up and threw my laptop to the floor. I ran upstairs and refused to go back down alone. The stupidest thing was that I doubted myself, and if it wasn't for the dog, then I don't know what would have happened. Her look toward me when she came downstairs. I can only imagine she was wondering why I wasn't running away. A friend told me it sounded like a skinwalker, and that Europe does have accounts of such things, but I don't know. I don't know what that thing was, but either way, I'm so happy that we moved. I've had a long history of paranormal things happening to me, but these take the cake. I lived in the middle of Hicktown swamps in Georgia when these took place. When I was 13, I ran away from home for personal reasons. I booked it to a local nature trail in the middle of a wildlife reserve. I ran down it about 15 minutes, and a hand reached out from the bush to my right and hit me in the chest. I got back up and looked for my attacker, but there was nothing there. I proceeded to run home, crying like a real man. When I was 15, I was laying in bed, scrolling through creepypasta articles, when I hear a sort of rhythmic tapping on my window. I freak out and pretend I can't hear it for a while, until I can't stand it anymore. I pull the curtain back. It's only a raccoon. I hit the window and scare him off and try to calm myself down. About a half an hour later, the same tapping, the same rhythmic pattern. Kinda like click, click, scratch, click, click, scratch. So I decide I'm gonna get my BB gun and take it out on the raccoon, scare him, you know, so he won't come back. So I grab my BB gun, I open the window, I take aim, and there's this shadowy figure that resembles a man staring right at me, right on the border of my lawn that connects my yard to the huge expanse of woods around my house. And it just stares at me and slowly walks into the woods behind it. After that, I didn't sleep for about a week. In fall of last year, on a walk down the nature trail with two of my friends, Antoine and Justin, we were just cracking jokes and drinking. It was 4 a.m. and we were just having a great time. On the walk back home, I feel this awful presence. I look behind me and I see something at the end of the trail in the distance. My vision isn't the best, but from what I could tell, it looked like a man with a deer head as his own. So I looked away. I told my friends not to say a word until we got home. Justin knew of my past occurrences, and he doesn't really mess around with paranormal stuff, so he listened and just kept walking. But Antoine just looked at me for like 15 minutes while walking perfectly straight. I freaked out and started doing the strangest movements of my arms to see if he would mimic them, and every time he would. At one point, I locked both my arms and put them on my head, and he did the exact same thing. I was ready to just leave him in the woods that night, honestly. Eventually, he screamed something completely unintelligible, and it scared the crap out of me, so I threw a punch at him and he dodged it. I apologized, told him to shut up, and then told them all to run home with me. When we got there, we discussed what we had seen and what happened, and Antoine said that he completely blacked out as soon as we started walking the nature trail, only to wake up to me throwing a punch at him. About two months ago, another thing happened, and this was where I drew the line. I've moved since this incident, and I honestly don't plan on ever going back. I was walking down the nature trail again. Clearly, I hadn't learned my lesson. I was listening to music, having a good time, and this thick, permeable smell of blood hit my nose. I genuinely thought I had a nosebleed for a second, until, through my headphones, I hear somebody talking. I take off one of my headphones and have a look around. Nothing. Speed walking out of there, it happens again. And this time, it sounds exactly like a man screaming, 
War bringer. Instantly, I'm on the verge of tears. I jerk back and look around as fast as possible. And I see it. There's a fully naked man, resembling more of a corpse than a man, with a bleeding, rotting horse's head. His arm was extended out toward me. I ran home and packed my things. Now by this point, I have so many theories as to what happened, but I hate indulging them. They all scare the hell out of me. My current idea is that I'm just nuts. I'm not sure, but whatever the case is, if there's anyone here who can explain what I saw, I'm very open to it. My mom, my mom grew up near northern Wisconsin, and she told me some stories a while back which happened to her, her brothers, and others in their area, and I feel that some of them are worth mentioning. I've had my own paranormal experiences, which I feel are quite difficult to talk about, and I've talked about a few of them on Reddit. But for now, I want to tell you another one of my mom's stories. One of the stories my mom told me was something that had happened to a family that had apparently lived nearby them. There was a family driving through the forests and eventually their car broke down. This would have been in the 70s or 80s before cell phones were widespread. So they ended up getting out of their vehicle and making the journey home on foot. Eventually, however, they started to notice sounds from behind them as if something was following them through the woods, or perhaps more aptly put, stalking them through the woods. When they ran, it ran. When they stopped, it stopped. Eventually, they were able to get to their house and they quickly entered, slammed the door and locked it. Whatever was following them let out a bellowing scream. Apparently, the family had alerted my grandfather as to what had happened and told him to look into his fields. According to my mom, he had apparently come back into the house wide-eyed and alarmed, but he didn't elaborate on what he saw. I vaguely recall my mom talking about him seeing some sort of glow in the field though. I'm unsure if it's related, but my oldest uncle went horseback riding with a friend and they apparently came across this thing. Apparently, it was white and furry and when it saw my uncle Mike and his friend, it stood up on its hind legs, bounded over a fence and ran off. Apparently it left behind some fur, which my uncle apparently collected, but this would have been many, many years ago. And my uncle died when I was about four years old in a bad accident. So I'm unable to ask him about the story. I'm unsure if both of these stories are related or not. And there could be some natural causes to these things. Black bears, wolves, dogs, etc. All would be living in the area. However, judging by the tone of the story and the fact that such animals are rather commonplace and it was apparently during the day, I'm not sure if it would have been mistaken identity or not. What does interest me though are the stories of the Wendigo, Skinwalkers, and the Wisconsin Michigan Dogman. Could it be related if it was not a case of mistaken identity? I don't know, and I don't really care to find out either. Just be careful in the woods. Mother Nature can be a cruel mistress, and there is darkness in the world, be it supernatural or the very, very real depths of human depravity and cruelty. Protect yourself and your loved ones. There's this forest near my house in the southeast of England that my friends and I use for mountain biking, but it's got this very uncomfortable, strange vibe to it. The only person we ever see here is the same older man walking his dog, but he always appears when we're feeling really uneasy due to the energy. 
He'll suddenly just walk past and you never see him coming. There's a tree that has become a memorial for a dog that died, coincidentally a German Shepherd, the same breed as the man has and looks very similar too. Sometimes in the farthest corners of the woods, I distinctly hear a dog collar behind me or nearby. Here's where things get a bit strange. There's a spot we use for campfires and drinking. We were there late at night, around 9 to 10 p.m., but gradually began feeling creeped out as the energy started to increase. We started hearing a very strange noise. It was definitely not a fox or a bird. It sounded very sweet and innocent at first, until it turned into a blood-curdling shrieking. We quickly packed our stuff and went on a mission to get the hell out of Dodge. There's a field that serves as the main access point to the woods. We were using the main path through it and got an overwhelming sense of dread, sadness, and almost anger all mixed together. In the bushes to the side of the path, we heard running, very heavy running. And all of a sudden, we started hearing the most horrible growling and screaming noises, getting worse and worse until we got to the exit of the field and it all stopped. We didn't hear it run away, but all the noises and running just stopped. We all had strange dreams that night. One time, I heard very heavy running footsteps in the bushes right behind me while my friend was having a pee. I turned around to see if it was him, but there's no way it was, because he hadn't moved from his spot. He came back and asked if I had heard the running too. Two days ago, I went back there for the first time in around five months alone, as I moved away from the local area. The strange feeling was still there, and in some areas felt like it had gotten worse, but I didn't let it bother me. I went back again today, and there was heavy rainfall the last couple of days, so the ground is very muddy. I kept hearing the dog collar that follows me around, and I noticed strange hoof marks in the ground, but they were very inconsistent. Groups of them would appear, and then there wouldn't be any more, until 15 to 20 meters up the path. They definitely weren't there two days ago, and these woods take so long to get into, Many people wouldn't bother going there, and it's impossible to get a horse in there. I have a few theories about this forest. One, I think it could be a similar presence to Goatman, as he was often linked to canine deaths. The potential cryptid activity and hoof marks are consistent with this theory. Two, very unlikely but plausible, it could be the devil's hoof marks. The presence feels very demonic. Third, the forest is potentially a dumping ground for bodies. There was a suspected murder in the local town and police searched the woods. It would explain the strange presence, but not the cryptid activity. Or four, people with dirt bikes sometimes use the forest. Maybe one of them could have died there and haunts us. People have told me that it's just a deer, but that is impossible. We don't get them around these parts at all. I've literally never seen one. I just have no idea what it is that we witnessed. Here are several odd encounters that I've had. Please tell me what you think they are or were and your thoughts on them. All of these occurrences have happened near the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. Not near Navajo land, of course, but I was hoping that I could be pointed toward the right information as to whether or not I encountered a skinwalker, or if there's some kind of Eastern cryptid that is similar. Number one. As a child, I used to be really interested in the supernatural. I constantly read about werewolves and vampires, but not about other cryptids such as skinwalkers and wendigos, until recently. I grew up on a farm surrounded by woods, and the first encounter I had with something unsettling would have been during a sleepover I had with two friends. 
After a riveting day running through the woods and having fun, we settled down for bed. It was a full moon and the light pierced through the blinds that I had. My two friends were sleeping on the bottom bunk while I slept on the top. They had fallen asleep, but I seemed not to be able to sleep, so I decided to peek through the blinds. The full moon stared at me, and I looked away for a second, but when I looked back, there was a creature. The head was shaped similar to that of a horse, with glowing red eyes and shaggy, thick, dark brown hair. It was about two feet lower down than I was, right outside my window, eye level with me. The window was about six feet off the ground. The bunk bed was also about six foot. So this creature must have been about nine feet tall. I don't know what it was, but it certainly scared me badly. Number two, my best friend C and my other best friend at the time, K and I were all having a sleepover together outside in a tent. In our tent, we had one light, a small battery operated lantern. It was dark and quiet outside when all of a sudden a stick was hurled at our tent. My friend C felt that we were in danger, but didn't know from what. C had just moved from Arizona near the Navajo reservation and had recently experienced a skinwalker herself. We had no way to defend ourselves so we decided to attempt to grab something that could be used as a defense from our car near the tent. C decided to be the one to go and grab it. As she went toward the car, she screamed. She immediately sprinted back with fear in her eyes. We asked her what happened and she told us about a large figure with glowing red eyes resembling a wolf. We ended up leaving that tent for good later on. Finally, number three. As an avid trail runner, I am used to the woods in which I run. I tend to run near dusk as the sun is setting, but I refuse to run when it's dark. I feel at home in the forest. I've never feared it, not until now. Only recently did I experience three odd phenomena. I began to feel like I was being watched while I ran. Yes, I know, the forest is always watching with all of its animals watching what I'm doing, but this feeling is different. It's more of a fear-inducing feeling. Then about four days after this began, I saw these glowing orbs. Only a couple, but they led deeper and deeper into the woods. All of this led toward a place my father and I found when I was young, where a deer's rib cage was stuck in the hollow of a tree, almost as if it was put there purposely. There's also a big mound of rocks near it. Those rocks were not just randomly placed. They were formed, like a large rectangular shape similar to a grave. I haven't seen the orbs since, but it was unsettling. By far the most unsettling thing that has ever happened there would be the amount of times that I've felt something was following me or chasing me in the woods. I've even had this gut feeling that something was trying to lure me deeper into the woods. Whenever I feel that something is so off and that there are malicious intentions, I turn around and go back. The feeling of dread has only gotten stronger and I'm at a loss for what might be causing it. So the area that my grandparents lived in was somewhat known for Bigfoot sightings, and my grandfather had seen some signs of it too, a set of footprints in the snow that strode uninterrupted over a four foot fence, calls from the forest, etc. They live at the edge of a state park in Ohio. I've seen plenty at this point, but back then I hadn't had any experience with the paranormal, at least as far as I knew. Bigfoot fascinated me because of all the cryptids it seemed the most plausible, and I'd spend some of my week there watching documentaries and discussing it with him. Now he wasn't much of a prankster, but it had happened enough that when something actually did happen, I just thought it was him. I had just gotten into bed at the end of their trailer. 
I was there for maybe 20 minutes, insomnia, when I heard this call outside the window, passing by quickly down the hill. Imagine an orangutan hoot, not a loud one, just that idle huffing that they kind of do to each other. Pitch that down a ways and then have it coming from lungs that should belong to a bear or a moose. As I said, my first thought was to rationalize that maybe it's grandpa messing with me. He almost had me too. This thought lasted until I remembered the way that the trailer sits on the hill. The bottom of these big windows is sitting six feet off the ground. The noise had definitely come from above me in bed near the tops of the window. So whatever made that noise was two or three feet higher and the old guy didn't own any stilts. I wish I'd gone to look, but the realization that something that massive had decided to make a noise right next to me just struck me with paralyzing fear. I was playing around an abandoned area within sight of the trailer later that same week, jumping around rotting beams and poking through whatever was left, when I just stopped. There was a massive, eminent presence behind me all of a sudden. No noise alerted me. I hadn't seen anything move. It was just pressure. Nothing inherently threatening in it, just the sheer weight of the gaze is what got me running. I have felt the presence of ghosts, at least one demon. What I'm pretty sure was eldritch shenanigans, and let me tell you, nothing has ever had the weight of that. The power. It felt more real and present than I think people can be. Anybody else have something like this happen? Not a sighting, but just a sense of something? An impossible noise or an encounter that was just too close? Let me know. This incident occurred during the summer of 1983, as I was about to begin my senior year in high school. My family lived in rural Pennsylvania, in northern Indiana County. Our farmhouse was built in the mid-1800s. In the early 1900s, an addition was added to the back that more than doubled the size of the original house. The original house was a four-square house, so-called for the four square rooms, two on the first floor and two on the second floor, with a staircase in the back. The house as a whole was sturdy, albeit a bit cranky. Every night in summer, I fell asleep listening to the pops, cracks, creaking, and groans as the house cooled off in the night air. The house was built on high ground next to the mouth of an ancient ravine that ran for over a mile deeper and darker and rockier as it went, down to the north branch of a little creek. The ravine was heavily wooded at the beginning. Then the trees got sparser to a few old ones tenaciously rooted into the eroded rocks and glacial till. It was dark and cool and damp down in there, even on the hottest summer day. And I spent many summer days down in those woods. I knew the plants, the trees, the birds, the deer. I heard much that I couldn't see, like the rabbits running through the brush and the squirrels high up scolding me as I walked. I could sense the ones that hid and made no noise, the bobcats lurking in the nocturnal critters and peeking at my back after I passed their burrows. Sometimes sudden waves of total silence would descend on the woods. The air would be still the birds would silence themselves. I taught myself to stop at these moments and to observe. I knew it wasn't me that made the animals go silent, so I figured something, a bobcat perhaps, was close by. I never saw what it was that caused the silences, but I loved to imagine myself as a skilled tracker. Nothing of the sort, of course, but I will claim to know those woods. I also had a friend and companion that roamed the woods and ravines around with me, a big male German shepherd named Chap. Chap loved to run and roam and chase groundhogs. We prowled along through the woods for years. This particular night, I awoke suddenly, 
very awake and alert. The wind was blowing against the open window. Our room had the crank out windows that were popular in the 70s when the hose had been remodeled. The bottom of the window tilted out and the rain ran off. There was a low rumble off in the distance, the thunder of a summer storm blowing in from the west. I was laying on my belly, my face on the left side on my pillow, and my arms around and under my pillow. I listened to the rain. It was not unusual for me to wake up in the middle of the night. It's been a regular occurrence in my life since I was very young. By that point, I was 17 years old. I was used to my 3 a.m. ritual, though still very irritated by it. Across the room, I could hear my brother breathing. I could hear our dog lying on the foot of my brother's bed, sniffing at the rainy night air blowing in the window. Across the hall from our room, I could hear my dad's low, steady, rumbling snore. Then I heard something that made my eyes fly open in the pitch black room. From down in the ravine, off in the distance, I heard an animal call unlike any I had ever heard. It was a roar, an angry roar. To the best of my knowledge, the apex predator in those woods was the bobcat, but this was too deep too throaty for a bobcat. Then I heard it again, surprisingly closer, a lot closer. I listened for my brother's breathing, silence. He was awake. What was that? I loudly whispered. I don't know, he whispered back. There was obvious concern in his voice. Then we heard it again. It had to be no more than 75 feet from the house, down at the corner of the yard where the trail led into the woods and down into the ravine. First of all, it was no bobcat. It was not a dog. It was not a coyote, and it was most definitely not a man. Next to my bed was a softball bat. I still have it, as a matter of fact. That night, all I wanted in the world was to slide my hand out from under the pillow and reach down and grab that bat. But I couldn't move. Everyone in the house seemed paralyzed. I kept expecting to hear my dad throw his bedroom door open, but he never made a sound. Then, two things happened in rapid succession. There was a tremendous crash, like something or someone had run headlong into the house. Then there was another roaring, screaming howl, this time right next to the house. It was an angry, roaring shout, so loud that I felt like it was next to my face. I had never in all my life heard an animal make a noise that loud. It was like a V8 engine with straight pipes was running wide open throttle. At the same time, there was a throbbing, a low frequency growl that seemed to make the house vibrate. All I could do was close my eyes and try to scream, but nothing came out. I must have passed out. The next thing I know, it was morning. The sun was shining. The house was still there. I slept in, which was very unusual in my family. I went downstairs, and my dad and brother had already left for the day. My mom stood at the sink, washing dishes. I looked at my mom wide-eyed. Surely she had heard what happened. She met my eyes and pointed to the back porch of our house a small side room that housed the washing machine, dryer, and coat closet. I walked to the back porch to see that the door that led to the outside had been ripped from its hinges and lay flat on the floor of the porch. In the coat closet, with his nose pressed as far back as it could go, laying in a puddle of his own urine, was Chap. He lay there, whimpering for two days before he finally came out again. I was given the task to fix the door. When it was up and repaired, I went to my mom and basically asked, are we just gonna pretend that nothing happened last night? My mom sighed with obvious exasperation and said something along the lines of, well, what would you like to know? You know what that was, your dad knows, I know, we all know. Not much to talk about other than how scary it was and frankly, I don't need to talk about that, thank you. And for my family, 
that was pretty much the end of it. I brought it up once not long ago. My dad just shrugged and said, I know as much now as I did that night. Me? I drive there on occasion, when I'm in the area. I stop on the old country road and listen a while. I listen to the wind and the birds, and then I drive on. Sometime in the early 1980s, my family lived in Arizona, as my father was stationed at an army base near Sierra Vista, which is some 70 or so miles south of Tucson. My father, myself, our neighbor, and his three sons were going to lend a hand in the construction of the neighbor's friend's home in the desert, a little over the halfway point between Sierra Vista and Tucson. I'm not sure what a couple of teenagers and a couple of eight-year-old boys were supposed to do, but we were going to be camping in the desert over the weekend. So it was an adventure to me and quality time with my father. For the sake of anonymity and to make explanations easier, we'll call their father Jerry, the eldest brother James, the second oldest Mike, and the youngest Tommy. At any rate, we got to where the site was and we set up camp. Our dad's and Jerry's buddies headed out to get some pizzas from the Benson, the closest town to us, close to a half hour away. It was about an hour before dusk and the four of us still at camp were just sitting around a campfire telling stories. The sun had now set and we were checking out the stars that were starting to come into view. Tommy and I hadn't really noticed anything until James had told us to get in the tent as he got up and pulled a rifle out of Jerry's truck. Quickly looking around, we took notice of several pairs of eyes just beyond the reaches of the campfire's light. There was a pack of coyotes all around the camp. Tommy and I made a mad dash for the tent and hunkered down inside, peering out at these watchful eyes through little mesh windows. That's when I noticed something odd. One of these coyotes wasn't like the rest of them. Its eyes seemed to be farther up off the ground than those of the others. The eyes were a deeper yet brighter shade than that of the other coyotes. The campfire made them all appear as silhouettes against the desert backdrop, but this one was much larger. To make it even stranger, the group of coyotes on one side of the camp were pretty much evenly spaced apart but the ones that I was looking at seemed to be farther away from the odd one. It was almost like they were intentionally keeping their distance from it. I'm not entirely sure what I was seeing, but I seemed to instinctively know that what I was looking at was not a coyote. Tommy and I were both scared, but we were scared for different reasons. I was so terrified, I was practically trying to get as low to the ground as I could while still keeping an eye on this odd coyote. If I could have gone past the bottom lining of the tent and buried myself in the sand, I would have. I heard the crack of the rifle as James sent around toward one of the groups. They scattered, but not the odd one. He stood his ground, didn't move an inch. James sent another round off toward the odd one. It flinched and stepped back a few feet. I don't know if he hit it or not. I just know that it scared the crap out of me, and I wanted it to go away. Moments later, the headlights of my dad's van came into view, and this odd coyote, along with the others, ran off. I didn't want to accept the explanation of just coyote, but I did, simply because I didn't know what it was, and I wanted to convince myself that I didn't see what I did. This was one of the few times that I have encountered something that terrified me. Some 30 years later and a whole lot of research, and I'm pretty sure I know what I saw. I just don't want to come out and say it. I 
I really hesitate to call this a skinwalker encounter, but I call it that because I really can't think of another creature that fits the description. So, here we go. A while ago, when I was in early high school, I was left alone at home for some reason. I can't remember the reason, but I was left home alone quite a lot after reaching my teenage years. So a little info on my house is that, although I don't live in a rural area, I certainly wouldn't call the area civilized. There are barns within walking distance of my house. I guess the area is developing because there are also subdivisions around. Also, my house has a sliding glass door that leads to a deck in the back. So I was home alone when I heard a knock at the door. It's common for my parents to sometimes leave the house without their house keys, so sometimes I would have to let them in when they got back. My family has a special knock that we use, so whoever's inside knows that it's one of us. This knock didn't sound like one of my family, so I just ignored it because I didn't want to deal with some stranger at the door. Whoever it was knocked again in a more familiar pattern, so reluctantly, I went to the door. When I got there, I didn't notice anyone out front. I figured that whoever it was just left because I took my sweet time getting to the door. Then I guess I heard a sound or something coming from the back sliding glass door. Another thing members of my family do is that if nobody answers the door, they'll try to find another way in, such as the back door. So I went to the back door and didn't notice anyone out there either. I slightly opened the sliding door and I heard a voice. It sounded like my mother, but it was coming from underneath the deck. The only reason I say that is because I definitely heard that voice, but my mother wasn't in view of me. Under the deck is the only place she could have been. I can't remember exactly what the voice said, but it was something like, open the door, and it said my name. Now I'm a super paranoid guy, and I know that my mom wouldn't be hiding if she wanted to come inside. So I shut the door, pulled the blinds over, and went to my room. Hours later, and my mom actually shows up, and I tell her what happened. She confirmed that she was not at the house earlier and did not try to get me to open the door. So for years, I didn't really know what to make of this experience. It was a very minor thing, but it spooked the heck out of me. I say it was probably a skinwalker because I don't know any other paranormal entities that would mimic a person's voice to try to lure you outside your house. But what do you think? My hometown is small and remote, and we had a Native American reservation a few minutes outside of town. I was close to a lot of the people that lived there, mostly the teenagers and children, as they shared extracurricular activities through the school, so I grew pretty accustomed to their beliefs. Now, I moved pretty far away right before I started high school, but I visited somewhat frequently, as I still had family there. My grandmother owned a camp on a small lake. It was very quaint and nice to spend time there. However, as soon as it became dark out, things felt very different. On one side, we had neighbors for miles. On the other, it was dense woods. My cousins and I, one a year older and one a year younger, had always found those woods creepy. We visited now and then, but always became very uncomfortable and soon left. One night, I was traveling back home down south with my cousins and my aunt. These were very remote lake roads inhabited by very, very few. Dense woods bordered both sides. So naturally, some nocturnal animals were out, but one that we saw was very different. It wasn't as big as I typically see these creatures described but it wasn't small either. Maybe the size of a large coyote or a small wolf. And we don't live in wolf country, by the way. But it didn't look like either of those. It was crouched back on its hind legs, just kind of chilling out. As we drove past, it turned its head to look at us. 
It had a pretty blank face, almost like an owl's, but without the beak, and a bear's muzzle instead. Its body looked like a poor rendition of a human, like if you asked someone to draw a person but they had never seen one before. Its legs bent the wrong way, like a horse almost. It had toes like an alpaca. Its arms were very long, and frankly, it was the most human thing about it. It had very patchy, wiry, matted fur. Now, I know it wasn't an animal with mange. I've seen many animals with mange. And yes, it's scary, but it was nothing like this thing. It didn't necessarily chase us, but it trotted behind us for a while. Everybody was freaking out, naturally. But I think deep down, I knew. Can I get any confirmation or information about what this might have been? And if so, are there any precautions I should take to keep this thing away? It happened years ago, but I'm still lost. It was winter of 2017, around December. I was camping with friends right outside of a Native American reservation near St. George, Utah. None of us are native, but we were trying very hard to be respectful of the land. We set up an A-frame and every night we packed in like sardines. I was on the outside and my buddy Seth was next to me. Coyotes are pretty common in this area of the country but they're pack animals who don't really engage with campers, so it's very common to hear them, but not as common to see them up close. However, every night that week, we saw this mangled old coyote, gray hair, blistering skin, probably on the edge of death. It walked with a limp in its front left paw, kind of like a dog that gets a pebble stuck in their paw. Anyway, we went to bed one night, and I was still on edge. Around 3.15, I woke up with a sharp pain in my ear. It ended up being a beetle burrowing in my ear, but that's not important. Anyway, I hit the side of my head, and I pressed my ear, and I was freaking out because it was this really acute pain that I had never felt before. I thought I was having an aneurysm or something. Anyway. I woke Seth up to have him shine a light in my ear. As soon as he woke up, he freaked out. Like, he was horrified. I was like, what is it? He reached above his head and gets a mirror, and he holds it up to me so that I could see behind myself. To my horror, there's a scraggly old man with gray hair, a huge tumor on the side of his face, torn up clothes, walking with a cane and a limp. He doesn't seem to be at all cognizant of us. It was almost as though he was in a different dimension. He didn't have a gun or anything, so we just clutched our knives and kept our eyes on him for the rest of the night. At one point, he just wandered away. The next morning, the two other people with us said that they both had a dream that this kid, Chris, who wasn't with us, was tied to a tree upside down and a massive silver glowing elk slowly but surely gutted him alive with its horns. They said the four of us and a few other friends all sat nude around the tree, not drumming or chanting, but almost like we were sacrificing him. They both had exactly the same dream and were able to independently draw the same picture down to the order that we were all sitting in to the number of branches on the tree without consulting each other. We texted Chris when we left, and he said he'd been up all night, throwing up, completely inexplicably. I don't know if we saw a skinwalker or what, but that was the weirdest experience of my life.
I think I had an experience with a skinwalker or its kin. I wonder how far their territory ranges. I lived in Phoenix for a couple of years at the turn of the century. I had two friends who grew up in Globe, a guy and a girl. She wanted to do a spell to make it rain. We went to a place on the Salt River. I don't know what it was called, but it had a parking lot, a pavilion, a bathroom, and the river had concrete steps in it, like man-made rapids. The pavilion had a concrete dais in the middle of it, inlaid with a mosaic of a compass rose. We got there at about 9 p.m. or so, well after dark, only two cars in the parking lot, and they were dusty, no other people. While we were doing our spell, which was minimal, all three of us standing quietly, concentrating around a candle and incense, I heard a noise. It was men and women laughing in unison, then two voices speaking very quickly, but I couldn't understand the words. And then a canine howl. My hair stood on end. We all jerked our heads toward the parking lot and stood stock still for a minute, but we didn't see anything or hear anything else. So we went back to concentrating. I didn't think the voices were weird in the moment. I figured the people that owned the cars had come back. I did think the howl was odd coupled with the voices, but I was thinking, cool, I got to hear a coyote. So after we finished the spell, we started wondering where the people were. And as we started talking, we realized that of the three of us, the girl had heard the speaking voices, the guy had heard the laughing, but I was the only one who had heard both or the howl. When I told them what I'd heard, they both got really pale. Their whole demeanor changed to alarm. And they said, we have to get out of here right now. I said, okay, but I have to pee first. They were very upset by this, but the bathroom was right by us. I went, but they were banging on the door in total panic after I'd been in there 30 seconds. I thought they were being overly dramatic. So we made it to the car and they're acting like we're in a horror movie. We left without further incident. After we got on the road, I asked them why they were so upset. They said that there were things that lived out there that I didn't want to know about. Apparently people who live in Globe have to deal with this kind of thing a lot, based on more stories the guy told me about living there. He never mentioned the word skinwalker though. I read about them later and finally understood why they were so scared that night. My grandmother on my mother's side has always been very superstitious for lack of a better word. She's not necessarily religious, but she does believe in a lot of paranormal stuff. Her mother was full-blooded Navajo and her father was Irish. Either way, she'd never been anywhere east of Montana and she grew up in Nevada. One year, when I was in grade school, we went to visit her. Most of the visit was pretty uneventful typical boring old people stuff. Except she always kept her curtains drawn shut and would always peek out the window. And whenever somebody would ask her what she was doing, she would simply reply, Yenoglushi is watching me. This went on for nearly the entire visit until a few days before we were due to leave. My grandma and my then baby brother, he's 19 now, we're in the front yard that evening planting flowers when all of a sudden my grandmother starts shouting, get away from that creature, it's not safe, to my brother. Of course, being in Nevada, we all assumed that my brother had found a scorpion or a rattlesnake, so we all run outside to see my grandmother clutching my little brother and shaking in terror against the side of the house. Standing out in the yard, was a large, black, Great Dane-sized dog. It was staring at my grandmother with an intensity that I have never seen before. It looked up at us, 
gave a little huff and bounded off. I don't remember if it moved unusually fast or not, but I do remember that it had very deep yellow eyes. When my mother asked my grandmother what had happened, she kept repeating, the Yenald Lucius found me. She moved a couple of weeks after that. I guess this story is a little boring, but it just happened to me, so here you go. I was rock climbing with two other guys in Colorado and was belaying one of them when the two of us on the ground heard something weird. The commands we use to communicate that we are safe at the top of a route are, name the guy on the ground, off belay, which prompts the belayer to unclip the rope from his belay device so the climber can pull slack out of the rope. The response to that command is, name of the guy at the top of the route, belay off. The climber was approximately 40 meters up on an about 50 meter route. I didn't know this at the time. The rope stopped moving, which isn't uncommon when someone is having a hard time with a move or is setting up an anchor, which is what we thought was going on. But then we heard it. A voice that sounded way closer to the ground like close enough that we could have had a shouting conversation and way farther left off route of where the climber should have been, said, my name, off belay. I looked at the other guy in our climbing party who was just as confused as I was. He said to me, what the F was that? And we discussed where the climber should be at this time and that we shouldn't be able to hear him that well. The rope still wasn't moving but I decided to keep him on belay. I figured it would be best to keep him safe and just feed slack through my belay device in the event that it wasn't him. Turns out it wasn't. A few moments later, the rope starts moving again, later followed by a faint syllable counted, my name off belay, that sounded way more like it should have. We didn't really think anything of it, but we had been traveling down the wall and hit a few routes without seeing anyone. We also had a friend just a few months ago that got burned in on a route when someone took him off belay when he wasn't safe. I remember seeing a video of a hiker or rancher or something walking down the road when he hears the voice of a woman calling him off the road. The guy stops to figure out what's going on, then just gets out of there because of how weird it was. I'm starting to wonder if there is a cryptid that can mimic the voice of a certain person. We're not entirely sure what happened, but we know two things. Number one, it's a really good idea that I didn't listen to that first voice. And second, it wasn't a person. I've been dying to get this story off my chest for years to people who don't think I'm crazy, as it's rather maddening. Before I begin, I don't believe in things like Bigfoot, werewolves, ghosts, supernatural or paranormal stuff in general, but that doesn't mean that I'm able to explain what happened this night. This was a long time ago. I was a teenager. My parents were not very strict, so I had a lot of freedom. I had two friends, and they had their own friends as well. And one of my friend's parents owned this huge part of a forest. My friends, their friends, and I went deep into the woods with a bunch of supplies, and we started making our own treehouse and forts. It was a big part of my childhood, building stuff with my friends, and this place became our sanctuary for a long time, where we'd spend a lot of our time away from the adults. This event happened years after we built the place initially, and also after we rebuilt it because one time it got destroyed. But that's another interesting story for a different time. This is the backstory for all of the events that I'm about to recall. One friend and I spent the night at our sanctuary that we had built, 
which none of us have ever done before. We only hung out there and then went home. We all planned to spend the night together because it would be fun. Most of our friends weren't allowed to spend the night there, though, because of parents and other things, and one chickened out because he was afraid. So it ended up just being me and one other person, my close friend's cousin. We weren't really close at the time, and we fought a lot, but surprisingly, we got along well that night. We spent most of the day swinging from trees, climbing them and hanging out on this tire rope swing while talking. It was a normal day, and then we laid down for rest at about 9 p.m. About 10 minutes after laying down in bed in our sleeping bags, talking to each other under our makeshift tents, we heard rustling. I sat up and saw a very tall silhouette of something that looked to be like a human but was transparent. I could see right through it. I squinted and froze, and it very quickly climbed this tall tree and as I was looking at it, it disappeared. I was in complete disbelief and shock. I had no idea what I had just seen, if I had seen it at all or if I had hallucinated. I wasn't scared in the moment, just perplexed. Being young and worried though, I said to my friend that we should leave, and not wanting it to hear me, I got close to his ear and just said, there's something in the woods looking at us. After I said that, I saw his facial expression turn to fear, so we got up and started walking down the path out of the woods, calmly. I didn't want to sprint because it might chase, and I also wasn't even sure I'd seen anything. I just didn't want to take any chances. Very shortly after we left, we both got this weird feeling of deja vu and confusion, like we'd been hit with hard drugs or something, except we don't do drugs, and we had only eaten food that we brought from our house. There are also no hallucinogenic plants in our part of the country. Nothing like that. Everything was so slow, and I felt disoriented. But we continued to walk in this direction for quite a while, stumbling in the darkness because of our mental state. I realized that we should have been out of the forest by now. I knew that this was the way out, 110% because I'd been going in and out of this place for years, even in the dark. Yet, I didn't recognize all the trees around us, just the path. It was like our surroundings were changing. My friend randomly yells, yeah, I'm coming, as I'm looking in the opposite direction from him. I turned around, very confused, and asked him why he said that. He said that his mom was calling his name to help lead him out of the forest. I heard nothing. I told him that I didn't hear anything, and he looked at me like I was insane and walked off the path and into the forest. I grabbed his arm and pulled him back, because I didn't want him to get lost. That's when my friend sees the transparent thing that I saw earlier, sitting perched on a tree branch in the direction that his mom was calling him from. He points it out to me. Its transparency is almost like a heat wave effect. We stared at it for 10 seconds in total disbelief. It looked like a transparent being, but we were trying to discern if it was something else and we were just imagining it being alive because there was no movement. But then it hunched down like it was trying to stalk or be stealthy and very quickly it climbed up a tree a little more and then went to the next one and then the next one, getting closer to us. We can't hear it at all. It's completely silent, and its silence was exacerbated by the fact that all the other creatures had also gone completely silent, and it was only in that moment that I had really started to realize that. Not a single bug or animal had made a sound since we started leaving camp. This is when our curiosity turned into fear, and once again, we began to see it move. Once it got above us, though, the only thing we could hear was the crunching of the branch as its weight was put down on it. Every little sound that was made was so distinct because it was so quiet and remote. We couldn't see anything because the tops of the trees are so dark. We actually started running, terrified, not worrying about being calm anymore. We heard noises in the trees above us and finally it faded away ahead of us as if it had gone ahead, but the sound was a lot quieter than if a normal animal had been running through the treetops. 
It sounded as if this thing was very light, but it wasn't very small, so that made no sense. We still kept running forward, despite it sounding like it had gone ahead, and we ended up back at the place that we started. Many, many minutes of walking, and we were back at this place after running for like 20 seconds. It was impossible. But instead of staying on the ground, we climbed to the top of the treehouse with our items as quickly as possible and closed the door, wedging a small piece of plywood on it to keep it shut. We heard something climbing up and extremely odd noises as well, almost like the mimicking noises of rain and wind, but there was no water seeping into our treehouse and there would have been had it been raining and it wasn't wet. This persisted for about a minute and then we didn't hear from it again. I'm pretty sure at that point it had left, but we spent the rest of the night there until the sun came up anyway, just in case. When he checked his iPod touch for the first time, right after we closed the door, it was 5 a.m. We started laying on the ground at 9 p.m. Eight hours had passed in what felt to us like no more than 40 minutes of time. Hours after we could start to see the sun through the treehouse slats, we went home. I no longer talked to this friend, but after this incident, we discussed it, and we told everything from both of our points of view, and it all jived. We randomly brought it up to each other every few months and relived it, making sure that we were still on the same page about what happened and that we both remembered. I never spent the night out there again, and I didn't really even let myself stay out there past 5 p.m. for a very long time. Some background. I grew up in northern Michigan, about 30 miles southwest of Traverse City. My grandparents also lived about five minutes from where I grew up, and they have a large acreage of woods, about 117 acres. Growing up, and still to this day, they have an old golf cart, and they've created long, sprawling trails in the woods. Somewhere in the middle of the acreage is a field about two acres, with an old sawmill. About seven years ago, when I was about 13, my sisters, nine and eight, and I decided to go on a golf cart ride through the woods on the trails. My nine-year-old sister sat up front with me, while the eight-year-old sat on the back on a mounted seat facing the opposite way. We drove up toward the field, and once we got through the trees into this area, I drove about a hundred feet in, and I saw this figure a ways ahead of me. It was probably ten feet tall and was human-shaped. Its legs dragged as it walked, and it was hunched over, and its arms looked semi-detached and dangled. Its face was a gaping black hole, but I saw what I thought was a dangling eye. My nine-year-old sister caught it too and it began to run toward us. I whipped the cart around and sped home. My grandpa went out with a gun to the field and found nothing. I have been able to find nothing on this for years, and my sister and I are still terrified to this day. The only legend I know of from up here is a dog man, but it wasn't that. I don't know if anybody else has seen anything or experienced something similar. Maybe it was a skinwalker or a wendigo. I really don't know. My story may not be the most exciting, but it's a personal experience that I have felt compelled to share. This incident took place in the summer of 2017, when my family was on vacation in California. It happened on the last leg of our journey, when we were on a road trip from San Francisco to Los Angeles to catch our flight back home. We had spent the day exploring John Steinbeck's family home in Salinas and were en route back to LA. 
The afternoon sun was setting over golden vineyards that graced the valleys we were passing, casting a warm glow over the landscape. Packed into a rental van, my family was mostly sleeping, apart from my father who was at the wheel, my grandmother occupying the passenger seat, and me situated in the rear of the van. As we curved around a bend in the road, my father's voice rang out, What is that? Being at the back of the van, I could only catch a glimpse through his side of the van of a dark figure crossing the road from the left. I anticipated seeing the figure on my side of the van within moments. As we got closer, however, the figure shifted from an upright posture to walking on all fours before disappearing behind the hill. I strained my eyes to spot it reappearing from behind the hill, but there was nothing. Given its size, equivalent to that of a man, there was no logical place for it to hide, leaving me bewildered. Both my father and I were puzzled, as he'd only ever seen the figure upright while focusing on the road. My grandmother, despite being at the front, seemed oblivious to the entire incident, perhaps lost in her own thoughts. My dad and I, both believers in the paranormal, have our theories about the figure. While he leaned toward it being a Sasquatch, I have contemplated the possibility of it being a skinwalker. This event remains my sole encounter with the paranormal to date, and it lingers on my mind. I still wonder about the identity of the figure we saw crossing the road that day. So I moved into my grandparents' house around five months ago, but I spent a lot of my childhood there as well. I smoke, so I find myself alone out on my back deck a lot at the evening and nighttime. The deck faces the garden portion of my backyard. To my left is the alley between our neighbor's fence, and to my right is a cemented area, including my garage and the rest of my house. And at night, even with a bright porch light, my backyard is dark, dark to the point that you can't see a foot past the deck. We have three sets of small motion lights that are continuously set off throughout the night, as well as a camera facing the backyard that will send motion notifications. And when watching the footage, there's only ever bushes and trees moving. Those really shouldn't set off the detector. I've heard noises every single time I go out there at night. At first, as any person would do, I passed them off as animals. The noises included thumps and scratching on the rain guard above the deck, footstep-like sounds on the concrete, and gravel being scattered, which is visible from my deck, and I've seen gravel tossed around with no possible cause around the area, branches crack above and in front of me, and trees and bushes are rustled. I've seen a humanoid figure twice in the farthest part of my garden. Both times I instantly went inside the house. I constantly feel like I'm being watched. Depending on what I'm hearing, I've felt worse, and I absolutely hate going outside at night here by myself. Just tonight I heard something that I haven't heard before, and the only thing I can compare it to is the screeching noise that squirrels can make, but mixed with an inhuman yell. I freaked the hell out and went right inside. I know a lot about cryptids, specifically wendigos and skinwalkers, and I really can't imagine that being what this is. But I'm a very logical person, and I can't find any proof of it being any type of animal. So who knows? A little background. My two closest friends and I were always trying to get creative with the games that we would play. One night when we were in the ninth grade, we were having a sleepover at T's house. T had a lot of toy weapons still in the garage that he never threw out, 
So in this game of hide and seek, the seeker used the lightsabers and nerf guns to tag the hiding players. We played outside at night in December, which made it spooky and hard to find each other. So once a player was found, they too would become a seeker. After a few rounds, it was my turn to be seeker. I first found Jay, so we quietly started searching for T. In T's neighborhood, all of the houses are really tight and dark, so we would usually hide in between people's houses. As Jay and I were walking down the street, I thought I heard shuffling in the rocks behind an AC unit. Of course, we thought it was T, so we started telling him, all right, come on out, you've been found, but nobody answered. Seconds after, a white, hairless head with dark eyes popped up and looked at us and then ducked back down. It was obviously not T, and like the kids we were, we ran off yelling T's name to come back to the house. He ended up being on the other side of the neighborhood, and when we went back to investigate, we found nothing. Jay and I still remember, and T makes fun of us because he thought we were joking, but we know we saw the exact same thing. I have no clue what it could have been, but it definitely looked like a person and not a person at the same time. I'm an adult now, but it still gives me chills. This story happened to my cousin, who was visiting our grandmother on the Navajo Nation Reservation. He was what you would call an urban Navajo, born and raised in Phoenix and rarely visited the res. He was raised in the church and was aware of certain Navajo taboos and folklore, but didn't heed or abide by any. He and his older brother used to stay at our grandmother's during the summer to help out with chores and the livestock. They call it sheep camp. However, sheep camp was a summer lodge or cabin in the mountains where you took the sheep during the summer months to graze. Being from the city, I guess they just liked the term sheep camp when in reality, it was just our grandmother's permanent residence. Like most rural residents on the reservation, old automobiles and appliances that no longer worked piled up in the front yard due to a lack of transportation or waste management options. There was an obsolete refrigerator from the 80s on the far left side of my grandma's porch and a broken down muscle car from decades earlier. The car was more of a skeleton, a forgotten remnant, that rested about 30 feet far off to the left in perfect eyeline sight from the porch. The model of the car I cannot remember, but the windows had all been busted out and the upholstery was weathered and cracked. The desert sand had reclaimed most of it, the tires were shredded and half buried. If you grew up on the res, this served as a derelict jungle gym or playground. My mother and I had decided to visit my grandma one afternoon when I was 12 years old, the same age as my cousin. We greeted everyone upon our arrival and our grandma fed us. My cousin asked if I wanted to take a walk to the canyon and told me that he had something to tell me. He seemed urgent about it. As soon as we were out of earshot of any of the adults or his older brother, he told me that something had happened earlier that day at about 5.30 in the morning. Although it was summer, in the Arizona temperate desert, it is easily many degrees colder at night and early in the mornings. He told me that he was awoken by the urge to relieve himself. The sky was dark blue before dawn. He was half asleep and it was too cold to run all the way to the outhouse, there was no indoor plumbing. So he continued to say that he darted to the left to pee behind the old refrigerator and off the porch. His eyes were half closed and his mind was still a bit hazy from just waking up. Then he hears the distinct sound of something jagged and sharp scratching in long successions on metal accompanied by the heightened whimpering of a sheepdog. His eyes opened wide, and he tried to scan the horizon to locate the origins of the hurt sheepdog. Initially, he thought he saw the dog trapped in the car, but there were no windows or any glass obstructing the dog's escape from the wreckage. 
He witnessed the dog clawing and scratching to fight its way out of the window frame of the driver's side. Its front paws were clawing at the outer shell of the driver's door, making the sound of nails on a chalkboard. He finished urinating and dazedly took one step off the porch to help the dog out of the car. Suddenly, he freezes in his tracks. A cold, wicked laugh ripped through the early dawn air. His eyes immediately fixate on where the laugh originated from, also inside the car. He rubs his eyes and focuses his gaze on the dog, and his eyes follow along the dog's torso. Then he sees that something has its arms and claws wrapped around the waist of the dog, preventing it from escaping. At this point, the sun had inched and crept over the mesa and turned the sky from a pale blue to a pale yellow. The pale yellow light revealed that the driver's side of the car was completely covered in smeared blood. He jolts back inside and bolts the door behind him. He doesn't tell anybody because he was paralyzed with fear. Fear that if he talked about it, nothing would stop it from busting through the door and killing him, his brother, and our grandma. I inquired about what it looked like, or if he even saw what had been holding the dog against its will. He said it looked like a werewolf, but a sickly one with mange. He noted that it was hairy, but you could see almost dry, cracked, gray skin underneath. He said before he ran, he slouched down to see what was holding the dog inside the car, and whatever it was, grinned. Its wicked smile was filled with sharp, jagged teeth beaming from side to side. In all honesty, I thought he was lying to me to try to scare me, thinking I was some dumb, uncivilized reser who would believe a werewolf tale. We spent some time in the canyon playing on boulders and throwing rocks into the small stream. I had all forgotten what he shared with me until we made it back to my grandma's house. That's when he asked if I wanted to see the scene of the crime, so to speak. I was skeptical at the time until we walked up to the car in question. I couldn't believe it. There were tufts of bloody, multicolored dog fur caught in the window frame, and bloody paw prints and smears on the outside of the driver's door. There were long scratch marks from the dog everywhere, not sharp enough to cut through the metal, but enough to make a slight indent. As if the nails were scratching down with so much pressure, that the protein from the nails, or whatever they're made of, buckled and gave way, filed down on the metal. I stood there in amazement and fear. All we did was throw dirt on the blood markings, and I haven't spoken of it until right now. Side note, the dog is okay. We spent all late afternoon looking for her. We later found her under an abandoned manufactured home on the property. She was afraid to come out for nearly two weeks. So my cousin said he always brought her food and water for the remainder of summer break. She's okay now, though, fortunately. I live in the upper panhandle area of Oklahoma, and I've seen a lot of weird stuff in my day, some of which other family members can attest to. One such weird thing would be a shadow creature that I see whenever I'm with my uncle in the countryside. Oklahoma once housed Native American Indian tribes, and the remnants of these still remain. One of their legends tells about a shadow creature who will suck your soul from your body if you don't leave your shoes by the trees while camping. Personally, I've never been camping, so I wouldn't really know about that. But I have seen shadowy figures, and heard unexplained rustling and scurrying, and sometimes noises around me stop when I see these entities. I'm wondering if anybody else knows anything about this, whether this is exclusive to Oklahoma, or if anyone else has had these experiences in other areas. I don't really know what these figures or beings could be, but I do believe that sacred Indian ground has some pull when it comes to supernatural beings and occurrences, although I don't know where specifically the sacred ground would be.
The other night, my mom and brother were outside taking the dog out. It was around 12.20 in the morning. She said that she saw something in the neighbor's yard, which is behind ours, walking in the yard. It was black and had a face like a gorilla, but slim. And it didn't look as big as the pictures of Bigfoot that supposedly people caught on camera. It was around six foot four to seven feet tall and walking very weirdly like it wasn't familiar with this area, or maybe even the planet. It was walking very sneaky-like, barely lifting its feet when it walked, kind of stretchy-like, and just looking forward. It didn't turn its head at all. She also said that she felt a very eerie feeling and that she's glad she trusted her intuition because she doesn't know what this thing would have done to her. Also, Way before that, she was taking a walk around the block, which is close to the woods, and she heard weird grunting sounds that didn't sound like any animal in our area, so I don't know what this could be. I wish I had more of an explanation or a description, but have any of you ever seen anything like this? I'm just going off the explanation from my mom, but she's pretty sure that she spotted Bigfoot. I wanted to tell this story, but I never tell it to anyone else because I know they won't believe me, and I don't want to be labeled a liar or a crazy, but here we go. So about five, maybe six years ago, my friend and I snuck out of my house late one night. My house had a river behind it and a forest across the road in front. So we go out and walk around, smoking a cigar I stole from my dad. We walked around for about an hour. By then, it would have been around 3 a.m. As we got closer to my house, walking along the forest line, I turned to my friend and looked past him into the forest. About 10 feet past the tree line, I see this big, human-shaped thing with either no neck or a very muscular neck and big shoulders. It was looking out at us. I froze and said to my friend, do you see that? He looks over and starts running as fast as he can. So I did too. When we got back to my house, we called it an alien because we didn't know what else to call it. It didn't look human, although it was human shaped, but we didn't know what it was. It wasn't until about three years later that I told my brother and dad about it and I described it to them. It was big, about eight feet tall and had a black body with a gold color head. So my brother googles what I saw, and apparently something called Old Yellowtop comes up, described as a type of Bigfoot with a dark body and yellow head. What makes it even crazier is that all the sightings seem to be in Ontario, Canada, which is where I live. I think the first sighting is from the early 1900s. My friend and I are both about 20 years old now, and to this day, we swear that's what we saw in the forest. Two years ago, I went to visit my grandparents' place for the first time in years. It's a small town and the house is located on a hill which extends to an open landscape. Anyway, it was night and everyone was either in the kitchen or bedroom watching TV. I had to go to the bathroom. They only have one bathroom and it's outside. So I make my way over taking my phone. I saw the neighbor's black dog that comes during the day to play with us and my grandparents' dog. Except it was weird for it to be outside at night. The whole property is surrounded by a concrete wall that has a tall, pointy metal fence on top of it. The only two gates accessible close or are locked at sunset. So there's no way that it could have entered since my grandparents and my visiting family all made sure to put all the animals in their place before locking the gates. 
The gates are always closed unless a visitor comes or to let my grandparents' dog go play on the open land outside the property with the neighbor's dog. But there were no visitors that day and it was too late for them to be out playing. So I start making my way to the bathroom and the dog appears from behind the bathroom building. It was wagging its tail and making these excited, low panting noises. You know, how dogs make when they're happy to see their owners. I start walking toward it and I see it gets all excited. It comes toward me and I'm petting it. Nothing was out of the ordinary. I just remember thinking how nice it was that this dog comes to play with my grandparents' dog. Then suddenly it starts walking away from me, back to behind the bathroom. So I go after it, thinking I'll call the neighbors and tell them that if they want to come pick up their dog, they can, or if they'll come pick it up in the morning, that's fine too. I just wanted them to know we had it. Their house is close to the bottom of the hill, which is about a 15 minute walk. And I wasn't about to walk alone in this town I don't know at that time of night. Halfway going after it, I get this weird feeling and I stop. I see it standing there, just staring at me. And being my dumb self, I take a few steps toward it, extending my hand and calling out its name. But the dog starts backing away slowly, not letting go of eye contact. That sends a red flag immediately, because the way it stepped back was weird, and the way that it wouldn't look away from my eyes creeped me out. It stepped back so slowly and into the dark. I turned my phone flashlight on and scanned the light around. I couldn't see it. It was gone so fast, too fast. I was going after it because apparently I have no common sense, but just as I started walking forward, I hear this weird bark, followed by one long howl. It wasn't exactly dog-like. I know because I've grown up with all kinds of dogs, and that's not how dogs sound. It sounded wrong. I thought maybe it was hurt, so I ended up calling my dad to come search for it. We scanned every inch of the property, but no dog. Both gates were locked. I got really creeped out after that and I couldn't sleep very well. And I kept hearing that weird howl all night. We checked in with the neighbors the next morning and apparently their dog was with them the whole time. I seriously don't like my grandparents' place at night. It's creepy as heck. The whole town is surrounded by creepy stories. Even my dad has had some weird encounters with these weird cloaked people and strange lights where there shouldn't be any. I have to go back this year, and I'm kind of terrified. Last summer, a good friend and I embarked on a backpacking trip through the White Mountain National Forest in New Hampshire. As fairly experienced day hikers, we felt comfortable in the whites for our inaugural overnight trip. While planning, my buddy Ellis figured that we could hike to a backcountry campsite to make our first wilderness night a little more fun. I wasn't going to disagree. Beautiful views, historic trails, and a protected night in the dry river wilderness. I was stoked, to say the least. Before any hiking trip, I do a little internet research on the trails or shelters that I'll be coming across. Throughout the mid to late 1900s, there were a series of these lean-tos up and down the dry river wilderness, meant for backpackers or through-hikers looking to escape the crowds in more popular areas of the forest. As time went on and the Forest Service had other, more pressing matters, many of these shelters were dismantled. Except for Dry River Shelter Number 3, the last remaining shelter in this wilderness zone. On the morning of our hike, I met Ellis at the trailhead and we set off. The sky was overcast, bringing with it a dense fog throughout the forest. The weather left us with nearly no visibility, so there went our stunning views. At least the trail consisted of prime, technical New England rock scrambling along the river. Ellis and I made it up to the Presidential Ridge, stopping by the Lakes of the Clouds. The hut was filled with day hikers, backpackers, and through hikers, all socializing together. 
We were even rewarded with some sun and a brief glimpse of the Dry River Valley on the summit of Mount Monroe before the fog rolled back in. With dwindling views and a stiff wind, Ellis and I hustled below the tree line down to the Dry River Shelter Number 3, our home for the night. Once we dropped off the ridge into the valley, we entered the wilderness zone where rangers patrolled sparingly. Time to really be alone in the wild. As we trekked into the wilderness, all signs of civilization disappeared, and the trail was densely overgrown. Although it had been raining all week, there were no footprints in the mud either. At least we would have some relaxing isolation, I figured. After about an hour or so of descending, Ellis spotted the lean-to, just as our legs were asking for relief. A gorgeous old timber structure with a well-used fire pit alongside a cold mountain river, pristine camping. As we settled in and explored the site, I found a small, bound notebook nestled into the corner of the structure. On the cover, somebody wrote, Dry River Shelter Number 3. Out of curiosity, I opened it but I found nothing more than a lone man's name scribbled onto the first page and a date. Just your standard camping log. Oddly enough, the man signed the book the previous day. We saw no footprints or signs of humans or even animals. No disturbance on the trails or here at the shelter. Rain can wash away tracks, but not all signs of animal life. Something felt off to me. I showed it to Ellis, who found it curious, but thought nothing more of the single name. He convinced me that the man was probably a hiking veteran and a professional at LNT. I bought into Ellis's thoughts on the situation to ease my mind. As the sun set, we started a roaring fire along the riverbank. Ellis commented how quiet the location was having not seen another soul beyond the chirp of birds since leaving the Crawford Path. The silence was eerie, but we figured that city life had desensitized us to the wild. The sun was setting and we grew tired with the darkness. Ellis took the lean-to and I spent the night in my tent. Sleep came quickly after hiking over eight miles with twenty pounds on my back, but this did not last long. A brutally sharp slapping noise woke me. The only thing I could compare the noise to would be someone swinging a 2 by 4 into a tree, or snapping a thick branch. I figured it was a bear searching for our food bag, hanging in a tree some 20 to 50 yards away. Nothing out of the ordinary for New Hampshire. Sleep overtook me once again, and I remember waking up to the sun rising over the peaks. I stumbled out of my tent to see Ellis also waking up slowly. As we made our morning oats and coffee, I wandered around the site again to see if I could find the marks that the bear left. Instead, I noticed something odd. The small notebook was open. I swear that I put it back where I found it, closed and in the back corner of the shelter, not open on the floor. Hey, Ellis, I said, were you checking out this camp log last night? Nah, I passed out, man. It's not like there's anything to read in there anyway, he responded. You sure? I commented as I bent over to pick it up. The lone hiker's name was not so lonely anymore. At least 20 more names filled the pages. The lone traveler, whose name was originally on the first page, could now be found several pages deep into the notebook. I tossed it to Ellis, whose face instantly dropped the second his mind registered what he was looking at. Great. Now I knew it wasn't just some dehydration delusion of the previous day. Dude, we must have been seeing things last night. There's no way we missed all these names. How could we? Ellis said. This is when I began to tell Ellis about the slapping noise during the night. I received nothing other than instant denial. These sounds were not the result of some hooligans or backwoods crazies harassing us. Ellis was convinced. Rather sternly, he commented, It's a bear, Jack. It's just a bear. Let's go now. And, well, go we did. Ellis led us out of the sight and on to our way home, not ten minutes later. 
A year has passed, and I'm still not quite sure what happened during our stay at the Dry River Shelter No. 3. The memory of seeing a single name written on the front page of the notebook is so crisp in my mind, I couldn't have mistaken it. Could I have mistaken the noises I heard and the new additions to the book? Ellis feels the same way about the whole scenario. What do you think? Could we have just been too dehydrated and delusional? Or were we not welcomed by the New Hampshire wilderness? Last summer, a good friend and I embarked on a backpacking trip through the White Mountain National Forest in New Hampshire. As fairly experienced day hikers, we felt comfortable in the whites for our inaugural overnight trip. While planning, my buddy Ellis figured we could hike to a backcountry campsite to make our first wilderness night a little more fun. I wasn't going to disagree. Beautiful views, historic trails, and a protected night in the dry river wilderness. I was stoked to say the least. Before any hiking trip, I do a little internet search on the trails or shelters that I will be coming across. Throughout the mid to late 1900s, there were a series of these lean-tos up and down the dry river wilderness, meant for backpackers or through hikers really looking to escape the crowds in more popular areas of the forest. Though as time went on and the Forest Service had other more pressing matters, many of these shelters were dismantled except for Dry River Shelter Number 3, the last remaining shelter in this wilderness zone. On the morning of our hike, I met Ellis at the trailhead, and we set off. The sky was overcast, bringing with it a dense fog throughout the forest. The weather left us with nearly no visibility, so there went our stunning views. At least the trail consisted of prime, technical New England rock scrambling alongside the river. Ellis and I made it up to the Presidential Ridge, stopping by the Lakes of the Clouds. The hut was filled with day hikers, backpackers, and through hikers, all socializing together. We were even rewarded with some sun and a brief glimpse of the Dry River Valley on the summit of Mount Monroe before the fog rolled back in. With dwindling views and a stiff wind, Ellis and I hustled below the tree line down to the Dry River Shelter Number 3, our home for the night. Once we dropped off the ridge into the valley, we entered the wilderness zone where rangers patrolled sparingly. Time to really be alone in the wild. As we trekked into the wilderness, all signs of civilization disappeared, and the trail was densely overgrown. Although it had been raining all week, there were no footprints in the mud either. At least we would have some relaxing isolation, I figured. After about an hour or so of descending, Ellis spotted the lean-to, just as our legs were asking for relief. A gorgeous old timber structure with a well-used fire pit alongside a cold mountain river. Pristine camping. As we settled in and explored the site, I found a small, bound notebook nestled into the corner of the structure. On the cover, someone wrote, Dry River Shelter No. 3. Out of curiosity, I opened it but I found nothing more than a lone man's name scribbled onto the first page and a date. Just your standard camping log. Oddly, though, the man signed the book the previous day. We saw no footprints or signs of humans or even animals. No disturbances on the trails or here at the shelter. The rain can wash away tracks, but not all signs of life. Something felt off to me. I showed it to Ellis who found it curious, but thought nothing more of the single name. He convinced me that the man was probably a hiking veteran and a professional at LNT. I bought into Ellis's thoughts on the situation to ease my mind. As the sun set, we started a roaring fire alongside the riverbank. Ellis commented how quiet the location was, having not seen another soul beyond the chirp of birds since leaving the Crawford Path. The silence was eerie, but we figured that city life had desensitized us to the wild. The sun was setting and we grew tired with the darkness. Ellis took the lean-to and I spent the night in my tent. Sleep came quickly after hiking over eight miles with 20 pounds on my back, 
but this didn't last long. A brutally sharp slapping noise woke me. The only thing I could compare the noise to would be someone swinging a two by four into a tree or snapping a thick branch. I figured it was a bear searching for our food bag hanging in a tree some 20 to 50 yards away. Nothing out of the ordinary for New Hampshire. Sleep overtook me once again and I remember waking up to the sun rising over the peaks. I stumbled out of my tent to see Ellis also waking up slowly. As we made our morning oats and coffee, I wandered around the site again to see if I could find the marks that the bear had left. Instead, I noticed something odd. The small notebook was open. I swear that I put it back where I found it, closed and in the back corner of the shelter, not open and on the floor. Hey, Ellis, were you checking out this camp log last night? Nah, man, I passed out, he said. It's not like there's anything to read in it anyway. You sure? I commented as I bent over to pick it up. The lone hiker's name was not so lonely anymore. At least 20 more names filled the pages. The lone traveler, whose name was originally on the first page, could now be found several pages deep into the notebook. I tossed it to Ellis, whose face instantly dropped the second his mind registered what he was looking at. Great, now I knew it wasn't just some dehydration delusion of the previous day. Dude, we must have been seeing things last night, he said. There's no way we missed all these names. How could we? This is when I began to tell Ellis about the slapping noise during the night. I received nothing other than instant denial. These sounds were not the result of some hooligans or backward crazies harassing us. Ellis was convinced. Rather sternly, he said, It's a bear, Jack. It's just a bear. Let's go now. And, well, go we did. Ellis led us out of the site and on our way home not ten minutes later. A year has passed, and I'm still not quite sure what happened during our night at the Dry River Shelter Number 3. The memory of seeing a single name written on the front page of the notebook is so crisp in my mind. I couldn't have mistaken it. Could I have mistaken the noises I heard and the new additions to the book? Ellis feels the same way about the whole scenario. What do you think? Could we have just been too dehydrated and delusional and saw the same thing independently? Or were we not welcomed by the New Hampshire wilderness? This past summer, my husband and I were invited down to a friend's cabin in Kentucky, not far from the Red River Gorge. We had so much fun during the week, going hiking and riding around on the four-wheelers, things like that. Saturday was no different, and we had an awesome day out in the sun with a nice dinner planned out that evening around the fire. We were setting up outside, and I was joking around with our friend about me believing in Sasquatches and how they like to tree knock. He humored me and found a two by four for me to knock against the trees. I excitedly knocked on the trees for a good bit until I was satisfied, but I didn't receive any knocks back. Soon, unfortunately, it started to rain, and I mean an absolute downpour that ended up knocking the power out. We got the generator running, lit some candles, and cracked some windows while dinner was cooking. Now, our friend had already told us that there were numerous Indian burial grounds on his property, and we were already in the midst of ghost stories. Dinner was soon done, and we were all eating around the table when I heard what sounded like someone talking right outside the back door. I immediately stopped eating and turned to the back door and asked our friend, what was that? He smiled at me and told me I knew exactly what that was from the stories he'd been telling us prior. I got up slowly from the table and headed to the back porch and sat down on the stool. I listened closely, and the forest seemed to come alive. Amongst the whippoorwill calls, there were voices, drums, music, and soon after, there was whistling. 
Now, mind you, his nearest neighbor was over a mile away, and they were an elderly couple, so there was no way that they would be making all this noise. My husband and our friend soon followed outside as well, and our friend recommends knocking on the trees again. I followed his direction and began knocking as loudly as I could. Still, there was no knock back, so I walked back up to the porch and sat on my husband's lap, listening to the music. The whistling continued, and we decided to humor it and to whistle back the exact same way that it had whistled. To our absolute nervous excitement, it began to whistle and pause, waiting for our response. We whistled back for a while, and our friend decided to hit the hay with his wife. Not long after he decided to go inside, the whistling came to a stop as well as the drums, music, even the birds had gone silent. It was the eeriest feeling I had ever had, and chills ran down my spine, when far off in the distance, we heard a loud, single knock on a tree. I opened my mouth in disbelief when a dragging sound broke the silence again. The sound was something heavy, dragging what I thought were its feet through the leaves on the ground. It started off by the front gate where the knock had come from and kept getting closer and closer until it finally made its way to the gravel surrounding the cabin. My husband whispered under his breath, what is that? We shined our flashlight down the side of the cabin to see nothing. My husband pushed me out of his lap and as a last chance to try to see what the sound was coming from, grabbed our friends to see if whatever this thing was would show up on thermal. We were frozen in fear, listening to this dragging noise approach where we were, and still we could see nothing. We were so scared we bolted inside. I've never seen my husband that terrified, and I've never been that terrified. Our commotion ended up waking up our friend, and he came out of his room to ask what was wrong. We told him what had happened after he went inside, and we told him that it was close to the side of the cabin. With the power still being out, we crept back to his room with the window still cracked, and we could easily still hear the dragging noise walking around the cabin. He built that cabin almost 20 years ago, and he had no words. He said he'd never heard that before and had no explanation. My husband had no words. I've never been so absolutely terrified, but yet excited in all my life. The next morning I walked out onto the back porch and the only thing that stood out to me was a single large footprint in the gravel. So back in 07, I was eight years old. My grandparents and I lived up on a mountain in northern Georgia in Floyd County, and our property was against the Bartow County line. It's a warm September night, just a couple of days after my birthday. I'm up in my room playing Call of Duty on my Wii, and my grandpa walks in and asks if I can take the trash out before it gets too cold. I say sure and pause my game and slip my shoes on. I walk out into the garage and open the garage door to throw the bag into my grandpa's truck. I turn on the light on the outside of the garage and walk to my grandpa's truck. Me being eight years old at the time, I was afraid of the dark, so I kind of sped walked and threw the bag in and hoped to make it. However, I did not make it, and I heard the bag land on the ground behind the truck. My head drops and my heart starts to pound for some reason. Like I know that if I go behind the truck, something will get me. You know, the basic eight-year-old paranoia. So I run to the back of the truck, pick up the bag and toss it in, and turn around to go back into the garage when I see something. The way my driveway is, it turns off a gravel road, then curves to the left and up a hill. The hill smooths out a little bit, but doesn't level off completely. Right where the hill gets less steep, I see a dark figure just standing there. 
In the light coming from the garage, I can just make out its silhouette. It appears to be a person at first, but then my eyes adjust and I can vaguely make out hair covering its entire body. I stand there frozen with fear, like if I turn my back it's going to sprint up and get me. So I hesitantly walk backwards toward the garage while keeping my eyes fixed on it. And it seemed that every step I took, it took one also. I finally reached the hole where the garage door is placed and ran as fast as I could inside. When I got inside, I ran into the living room for my grandpa. And I say, Grandpa, get the gun. There's something in the driveway. It's big and it's walking on two feet. I don't know what it is, but it scares me. So my grandpa got the gun and we go outside on the front porch, which is a good 40 yards closer to the part of the hill that I saw it on. And it's not there. My grandpa says, you sure you saw something? I don't say anything. I just nod. He drops the gun from the shoulder and says, come on, you haven't put the new trash bag in the can yet. We both turn around and walk back inside. Several hours go by and nothing else happens, until about 1 a.m. I wake up from having a nightmare of what I saw. I lay in my bed and look at my curtained windows, and I can see that the front porch light is on. I find that safer because it acts as a sort of nightlight for me, so I'm laying there looking at my window when I see a huge shadow walk right in front of my window on the outside, and I mean huge. The window sat about two feet off the ground, was about four feet tall, and was about two and a half feet from the ceiling. And this shadow was tall enough to cast a shadow big enough to where it looked like someone was sliding a wall past the window. I could hear the boards creaking out on the front porch and could see how wide this thing was from a side view. This thing, whatever it was, was at least two feet wide from the side and it was absolutely huge. I didn't want to go get my grandparents because I didn't want them to get mad for waking them if there was nothing there. So I just watched this thing walk back and forth past my window, and before too long, somehow I fell asleep. Fast forward to the summer between my sophomore and junior year in high school. I had moved off the mountain, but was still going to the same school. Anyway, like a week before school got out, my best friend Kevin and I thought that it might be a good idea to go up to the mountain and to see if we could find this thing. Maybe it was still there. Without hesitation, I jumped at the opportunity. So the following weekend, after school ended, I met up with him and we brought some camping gear, along with some food, and a 30 odd 6 I tell him we can camp out at the house that I saw this thing at, and he agreed that that was the best place to start. So we make it to the night and he's like, let's get out and walk around. I say, okay. So we both get out of the tent. I instantly felt like I was being watched. I shouldered the rifle and I felt the adrenaline filling my veins. Kevin put his hand on the barrel and lowers the end of the gun to the ground. Don't do that, he said. You'll make me nervous. So we start walking around the woods. We find some small game paths and hear a few noises but we don't really find anything. So we both look at each other and decide it's not worth it, so we start walking back to the tent. This walk will take us at least about 30 minutes. On our way back, we can hear things in the woods that sound like tree knocks and whoops. We get about 100 yards from the property that we're camping out on, and suddenly a rock flies through the woods and lands within 10 feet of Kevin and I. Then it's like it just unloaded on us, Rocks were landing all around us with almost no time in between impacts. We hear all sort of whoops and hollers coming from different directions, almost like we were being surrounded, hunted. I tell Kevin to run, that I'd be right behind him. So we start running toward the property and hear the trees snapping behind us. I stop for a split second to raise the gun and fire a warning shot into the air. And then, all went silent. Kevin stops just in the clearing of the property and looks back at me. I looked back at him and we both run onto the property and book it out of there as fast as that pickup truck we drove would take us. I haven't been up there since and I don't intend to return.
For some background, I live in the California foothills. My parents and I moved into this house from the city in late 2017, after it had been sitting empty for over a year. The day we moved in, my mother and I arrived first to clean, while my father and brother drove the moving truck. Right off the bat, I was uneasy, but I tried to write it off. The property felt heavy, is the only way I can describe it. Some people on here describe the feeling of being watched inside their homes, but I had that feeling any time I stepped outside. We were going to sweep and mop the floors, dust the baseboards and window sills, when I started noticing this white granular powder all along the baseboards and the window sills and the doorways. I immediately told my mother, who told me not to worry about it and just sweep it up. By the time I had swept up every room and cleaned off the window sills, I was certain that it was salt, and a lot of it. But fine, whatever, the people that lived here before were superstitious. All right, I can live with that. We unpacked the truck over the next week. I was setting up my room when the next bizarre events started happening. Knocking on the windows. Always quick raps that sounded like someone knocking with their knuckles. It would happen so often on all the windows in the house, but when you would turn, no one would be there. You'd go outside and no one would be around the house. This only escalated. My brother would stay up late in his room on his computer every night. He liked to game with his friends until early in the morning. He does not spook easily, but on more than one occasion I would wake up to him shaking me awake, terrified, saying something massive on two legs was walking around outside his bedroom window, which he would have open at night. He said it would walk right up to his bedroom window and stop, and when he would look toward the sound, he could hear it scrambling away. I never saw it with my own eyes, and neither did he, but the motion lights outside would be activated every single time, leading to the woods near the back of our property. I know what you're probably thinking. All of this up to this point can be explained away rationally. A crazy person living in the woods, some neighbor messing with us for whatever reason. Well, that was what I told myself too, so I could sleep a little easier at night. And then the banging started. It was so loud, and it would sound like it was coming from everywhere at once. The walls would literally vibrate, picture frames rattling right off the walls. It was like something massive, stronger than any crazy person, was pounding on the exterior walls of the house, always late at night, and always in more places than just one. I could never pinpoint the source directly. My brother and I would stumble out of our bedrooms petrified, and my mom would lead us to her room where we would stay after that. My dad would walk the perimeter of our property with his gun, but he never found anything. No footprints, no people, nothing. This happened for probably six months, and every time a major event would happen, my dad would walk the perimeters with his rifle and come back with nothing. We felt like we were going insane. And then, suddenly, it just stopped. The mutilated animals stopped appearing. I stopped feeling like I was being watched any time I would go outside. My dogs stopped being so on edge any time I took them out. And the property itself seemed to get lighter, like it finally took a deep breath after holding it for so long. I genuinely have no explanation or even a clue as to what that creature, being, or entity even was. I'm just glad it seems to have moved on. Hopefully it didn't stop because it moved in. So I'll keep this kind of brief, as I know talking about these creatures is somewhat dangerous. My hometown is small and remote, and we had a Native American reservation a few minutes out of town. I was close to a lot of those people, mostly the teenagers and children, 
as they shared extracurricular activities through the school, so I grew pretty accustomed to their beliefs. Now, I moved pretty far away right before I started high school, but I visited somewhat frequently, as I still had family there. My grandmother owned a camp on a small lake. It was very quaint and nice to spend time there. However, as soon as it became dark out, things felt very different. On one side, we had neighbors for miles. On the other, it was dense woods. My cousins, one a year older and one a year younger than me, and I had always found these woods creepy. We visited now and then, but always became very uncomfortable and soon left. One night, I was traveling back home down south with my cousins and my aunt. These were very remote lake roads, inhabited by very, very few. Dense woods bordered both sides, so naturally some nocturnal animals were out. But one we saw was very, very different. It wasn't as big as I typically see these creatures described, but it wasn't small either maybe the size of a large coyote or a small wolf, and we don't live in wolf country. But it didn't look like either of those. It was wrong. It was crouched back on its hind legs, just kind of chilling out. As we drove past, it turned its head to look at us. It had a pretty blank face, almost like an owl's, but without the beak, and a bear's muzzle instead. Its body looked like a poor rendition of a human. Like if you asked a person to draw a person if they'd never seen one before. Its legs were bent the wrong way, almost like a horse. It had toes like an alpaca. Its arms were very long, and the most human-like thing about it. It had very patchy, wiry, and matted fur. I know that it was not an animal with mange. I have seen animals with mange, and yes, it's scary, but it was nothing like this. It didn't really chase us, but it trotted behind us for a while. Everybody was freaking out, naturally, but I think deep down, I knew. Can I get any confirmation or information about what this might be? And if so, any precautions I should take to keep it away? It happened years ago, but I'm still just lost. Mimicking Cryptid by user Tommy Sticks eighty seven posted to R slash paranormal in a comment. My story is a little boring, but it just happened to me on Wednesday, so here you go. I was rock climbing with two other guys in Colorado and was belaying one of them when the two of us on the ground heard something weird. The commands we use to communicate that we are safe at the top of a route are, whoever the name of the guy on the ground is, off belay. So for instance, Tommy off belay which prompts the belayer to unclip the rope from his belay device so the climber can pull slack out of the rope. The response to that command is always the name of the guy at the top and belay off. So if Mark is at the top and Tom is at the bottom, Mark will say, Tom, off belay. Tom will then unclip the rope from his belay device so that Mark can get some slack. And the way he indicates to Mark that the slack is there is by saying, Mark, belay off. Obviously, this communication is very, very important. The climber was approximately 40 meters up on a 50 meter route. I didn't know this at the time, though. The rope stopped moving, which isn't uncommon when someone's having a hard time with a move or is setting up an anchor, which is what I thought was going on. And then we heard it. A voice that sounded way closer to the ground like close enough that we could have had a shouting conversation and way farther left off route. It said, off belay. I looked at the other guy in our climbing party who was just as confused as I was. He looked at me like, what the heck was that? And we discussed where the climber should be at this time. We both determined that we should not be able to hear him that well. The rope still wasn't moving, but I decided to keep him on belay. 
I figured it would be best to keep him safe and just feed Slack through my belay device in the event that it wasn't him. Well, that ended up being a really good thing because it wasn't him. A few moments later, the rope started moving again. Later, followed by a very faint syllable counted, hey, off belay, but my name. That sounded way more like what it should have. We didn't really think anything of it, but we had been traveling down the wall and hit a few routes without seeing anyone. We also had a friend just a few months ago that burned in on a route when someone took him off belay when he wasn't safe. I remember seeing a video of a hiker or rancher or something walking down the road when he heard this voice of a woman calling him off the road. The guy stops to try to figure out what's going on and then just gets out of there because of how weird it was. Maybe it was nothing, but at the same time, if I had listened to that voice, it could have ended really badly. It's almost like something wanted to cause harm. Possible Cryptid Near Cook's Forest, Pennsylvania by user Beef Pastry, posted to r slash paranormal in a comment. So here's an experience that I had that I can't really explain. First time posters, so sorry if this story doesn't read well, but this is what happened. This occurred in the summer of 2010. My stepdad has an old hunting cabin out in Siegel, Pennsylvania. It's like a 10 minute drive outside Cook's Forest. It's a small place with a common area and kitchen and a single bedroom with two bunk beds and a queen size bed. My mom, stepdad and I stayed at the cabin for a weekend to get rid of all the trash other family members had left there and to do any repairs. There are other cabins nearby, but this weekend there was nobody at those cabins. There was nobody within a half mile. There's also no street lights or really even cell service. This is quite literally off the beaten path in the middle of the forest. We came up on Friday, worked all day Saturday and left Sunday. On Saturday evening after dinner and a bonfire, everything was pitch black outside. No bugs chirping, dead quiet, which is relatively normal for that area. At least most of the times it's pretty quiet at night. So we decided to head in for the night. My stepdad and I are inside reading while my mom steps out to have a smoke and check to see if the fire had been burned down safely. I'm mid page in my book and I hear my mom yelp pretty loudly. Now I'm kind of used to her making this yelp. She does it when she sees a snake or gets a bug in her hair. So I didn't really think anything of it. She comes in limping and says, someone threw a rock at me. Immediately, my stepdad grabs his gun and runs outside, hoping to catch whoever did it. I was in shock, not sure of what to think. I'm sitting with my mom while he made laps around the cabin. He fired a couple of warning shots, but never heard anybody run away or any rustling or anything. When we go up, we always make jokes about Bigfoot now, although I don't know if that's really what it was or not. To be clear, there were no cabins on the road near us that had people staying at them. So I don't know who would be lurking in the woods in pitch blackness, fooling around with people. I mean, who would just stand outside in the pitch black with a rock, hoping there was someone on a porch to throw it at? We still don't know what happened. Shadow of the Giant by Mark L. I had always been an avid backpacker, seeking the solitude and beauty of the wilderness. This particular adventure took me to the remote forests of the Pacific Northwest, a region famous for its vast, unspoiled nature. And, of course, the legendary Bigfoot stories. It was the third day of my trek, and I had set up camp near a small clearing surrounded by the dense coniferous forest. The evening was calm, 
with a faint mist settling among the trees as night fell. I was sitting by the fire, enjoying the peacefulness, when a sudden rustling in the bushes startled me. I grabbed my flashlight, shining it toward the source of the noise. My heart raced as I caught sight of a massive, shadowy figure moving just at the edge of the light's reach. It was far larger than any bear or animal that I knew, covered in what appeared to be thick, dark fur. Frozen in place, I watched as the figure moved slowly, its heavy footsteps thudding against the forest floor. It seemed to be observing me, its presence imposing yet not overtly threatening. A part of me wanted to believe that it was just a bear, but the shape, the sheer size of it, it was unlike anything I had ever seen. In a moment of bravery, or perhaps foolishness, I called out to it. The figure stopped and there was a tense silence. Then, in a low, guttural sound that wasn't quite a growl, but was not human, it responded. The sound echoed through the trees, sending chills down my spine. I stayed still, not daring to move, as the creature slowly retreated into the darkness, the sound of its footsteps gradually fading away. I didn't sleep that night, my mind racing with what I had seen. Was it really Bigfoot, the elusive creature of legend? Or just my imagination, fueled by the tales and isolation of the wilderness? At dawn, I ventured to where I had seen the figure. There, in the soft earth, were large footprints unlike any animal tracks I knew. They were deep and distinct, leading off into the forest. I followed them for a short distance, but soon lost the trail. I left the forest with more questions than answers. The encounter remained with me, a haunting experience that blurred the lines in my mind between reality and what could really exist out there. I don't know if it was really Bigfoot or not, but whatever it was, it was something extraordinary. The Forgotten Hour by Darius is Missing. My name is Darius, and last summer, I decided to spend a week alone hiking and camping in the vast woods of Maine. I've always found solace in nature, and this seemed like the perfect escape from the hustle of city life. On the first morning, I awoke to find strange symbols etched into the dirt just outside my tent. They were intricate, unlike any natural markings or animal tracks I had seen before. I brushed it off as a curious anomaly, perhaps the work of a fellow hiker or a local playing tricks. However, each morning, new symbols appeared, each different from the last. They seemed to form a pattern, a language I couldn't decipher. My curiosity turned into unease. I was supposed to be alone out here, miles away from the nearest trail. Determined to uncover the source, I decided to stay up one night. I sat outside my tent, watching the moon travel across the sky, the forest alive with nocturnal sounds. But then something inexplicable happened. As the clock on my watch neared 3 a.m., there was a strange, almost imperceptible shift in the air. And the next thing I knew, it was 4 a.m. An hour had passed in what felt like a breath and I had no memory of that lost time. In front of my tent were fresh symbols, more complex than ever. The realization that something had occurred during that missing hour, right in front of me without any recollection, sent a wave of terror through me. I wasn't just an observer, I was a part of whatever was happening. I packed my gear as the sun rose, cutting my trip short. The thought of spending another night and potentially losing more time was unbearable. As I hurried out of the woods, I couldn't shake off that feeling of being watched. 
I couldn't get those symbols and the lost hour out of my head. Even now, back in the safety of my home, I often find myself staring at the clock as it nears 3 a.m., half expecting to lose myself in that forgotten hour again. The Hidden Grove by Kyra L. This last autumn, I embarked on a solo hike through the woods of the Hartz Mountains, a region in Germany steeped in lore and mystery. My plan was to follow a well-trodden path to the Brocken, the highest peak, known for its panoramic views and eerie history. As the sun began to dip, casting long shadows through the trees, I realized I had strayed off the marked trail. The dense canopy overhead muffled the sounds of the forest, leaving a heavy silence. I checked my map, trying to regain my bearings, when a soft whisper reached my ears. It was a gentle, coaxing voice, barely audible over the rustling leaves. It seemed to tell me to follow it. Looking around, I saw no one. I felt a shiver run down my spine, but rationalized it was just the wind making sounds that seemed like a voice. However, the whispers persisted, growing slightly louder, guiding me deeper into the woods. Despite my better judgment, curiosity led me forward. I wandered through the dense thicket, the whispers growing clearer with each step. The trees around me seemed ancient, their gnarled branches intertwining like silent guardians of some kind of forgotten realm. The air grew cooler, and a faint mist began to rise from the forest floor. Then, I stumbled into a clearing. It was a hidden grove, encircled by towering trees. Their trunks were covered in strange symbols that looked centuries old. In the center of the grove, a stone altar stood, worn by time. The whispers ceased abruptly, replaced by an overwhelming silence. I approached the altar, my heart pounding. On it lay a small, intricately carved wooden figure, its features weathered by age. The moment I touched it, a cold gust of wind swept through the grove, causing the trees to sway and groan. The whispers returned, now a chorus of indistinct voices, as if the trees themselves were speaking. Fear gripped me. I knew I had to leave. I turned to retrace my steps, but the path I had come through was gone, replaced by an impenetrable wall of trees. Panic set in as I realized that I was well and truly lost. For what felt like hours, I wandered the whispers following me, sometimes guiding and sometimes seeming to mock me. Just as I thought I was about to be lost forever, a familiar sight appeared, a marked trail, the one I had left earlier. I hurried back, not stopping to look back at that grove. Reaching the safety of my car, I glanced back at the forest. The sun had fully set and the woods were swallowed by darkness. The whispers were gone, but the haunting memory of that grove remained, and honestly it still does. I don't know what was there in the depths of the Hearts Mountains, but I don't think I'll be returning to find out. The Mimic by Julius978 My friends, Mark, Pablo, Tyler, and I had planned this backpacking trip in the Colorado wilderness for months. As experienced campers, we were excited to explore the remote trails and rugged beauty of the area. Little did we know our adventure would turn into a chilling encounter that we would never forget. The first odd occurrence was with Tyler, 
He wandered off a short distance to gather firewood, but returned pale and shaken. He claimed that he heard Mark calling him deeper into the woods, but Mark had been with Pablo and me the whole time. We laughed it off, thinking Tyler was just hearing things and scaring himself. The next day, it was Mark who got separated. He had gone to check our trail map by a nearby stream. When he returned, he was visibly disturbed, insisting that he had heard Pablo's voice beckoning him into a dense part of the forest, away from the stream. This was impossible, since Pablo had been fixing his boot at the campsite. And then it happened to Pablo. He had gone to scout a nearby hill for a better view of the landscape. On his return, he was almost hysterical, swearing that he heard me calling out to him from the opposite direction of the campsite. That evening, as we sat around the campfire, we shared all of our experiences. And that's when it kind of dawned on us. There was something in the woods mimicking our voices, trying one by one to lure each of us away from the others. The atmosphere grew tense. The once familiar woods now felt menacing, filled with unseen threats. We recalled stories of skinwalkers, creatures of Native American lore, known to mimic human voices to isolate and prey on their victims. The thought that one could be stalking us was terrifying. We decided to leave at first light, cutting our trip way short. That night, none of us slept. We kept the fire burning bright, and every rustle in the woods made us jump. The feeling of being watched, of being hunted, was overwhelming. As dawn broke, we quickly packed up our camp and left. With each step away from the campsite, the weight of the forest's gaze seemed to lessen, but the fear was still there. We've been on lots of backpacking trips since, but we've never returned to that particular campsite, and I doubt we ever will. I don't know if it was a skinwalker or something else, but whatever it was, it did not have good intentions for us. The Time We Were Chased by Fanatic Hiker 98. My friend Mariana and I decided to go for a day hike while camping in a secluded area known for its breathtaking scenery. The plan was simple, explore the nearby trails, enjoy the natural beauty, and return to camp before dusk. We were deep into the hike, marveling at the lush greenery and the occasional wildlife sightings, when Mariana noticed something odd in the distance. Squinting, I could barely make out a humanoid figure standing motionless among the trees. It was too far to discern any features, but its presence alone in such a remote place was deeply unsettling. Trying to shake off any uneasy feeling, we continued along our hike, but I couldn't help glancing back. Each time, the figure seemed a little bit closer, still motionless, like a statue observing us. Mariana suggested that it might be another hiker, but something about it just felt off. As we made our way back to camp, a sudden rustling behind us made us turn. The figure was now unmistakably following us, its movements unnatural, almost jerky, like a scene out of a horror movie. Panic set in. We increased our pace, but so did the figure. It was definitely chasing us. Our leisurely hike turned into a frantic run. I could hear the figure's footsteps gaining on us. The sound unnervingly human, yet distorted. Mariana and I dared not look back, our hearts pounding in our chests as we raced through the woods. Finally, the campsite came into view. We burst into the clearing, out of breath and terrified. Turning around, we saw the figure stop at the edge of the forest just staring. It didn't cross into the campsite, and after a few minutes that felt like an eternity, it slowly retreated back into the woods. We packed up our camp in record time, 
not even bothering to properly take down the tent. We were silent the whole way home, just processing what had happened. And we've never been back since. The Whistler by Laurel. My name is Laurel, and I have always been drawn to the quiet solitude of the forest. One fall morning, I set out to forage for mushrooms in the dense woodland not far from my home. The forest has always been my place of peace, a sanctuary away from the chaos of everyday life. As I wandered through the trees, my basket slowly filling with chanterelles and morels, I heard the sound of footsteps behind me. Assuming it was another hiker or a forest ranger, I didn't really pay much attention to it at first. But as I continued walking, the footsteps persisted, perfectly matching my pace. When I stopped, they stopped. An uneasy feeling began to settle over me. I called out a hello, but I didn't receive a response. The forest was completely silent, except for those footsteps. I quickened my pace, hoping to distance myself from whoever or whatever was following me. But the footsteps kept up, never getting any closer or farther away, but keeping the same distance all the way. Then I heard the whistle. It was faint at first, like a distant melody carried by the wind. But within moments, it grew louder, as if the source was rapidly approaching me. The tune was unfamiliar, hauntingly beautiful, yet deeply unsettling. I spun around expecting to see someone, but there was no one in sight. The woods were empty, yet the whistling continued. And now it was so close, it felt like it was right beside me. Panic completely took over. I couldn't see anyone, but I could feel the presence. I could hear the whistle in my ear, as if someone was standing right there. In sheer terror, I ran. I sprinted through the forest, the whistling and the footsteps following me every step of the way. Branches scratched at my face and my lungs burned with the cold air, but I didn't stop until I burst out of the tree line and into the open. When I finally reached the safety of my car, I looked back. The whistling had stopped and the woods seemed as serene as ever, but I knew what had happened. At least I knew what my experience was, even if I didn't know the source. And I knew that I couldn't go back. I couldn't risk encountering that invisible presence again. And to this day, I never have. Mushroom hunting used to be something that I loved, but now it's something I used to do. I don't know what it was out there, but I think I'm okay never finding out. I haven't really spoken to anyone about this other than my boyfriend and his brother, his brother gave off the impression that he thought I was crazy and laughed it off, so I've not said anything to anyone since. It's been driving me crazy ever since I saw it. This happened in March of 2021. Where I live in England, there's a lot of countryside. At the time it happened, I was driving down a small country road that was parallel to a main road, just a large field and bush on the other side next to the main road to separate them. I was talking to my boyfriend, and I noticed this very tall, human-like figure at the side of the road. It was extremely skinny, like it was skin and bones and nothing else. It didn't appear to have any clothes on, it had pale skin, and it looked really unhealthy. I didn't really see its face, but from the quick glance I got, it looked like it had indistinguishable facial features, like it had been blurred in Photoshop or something. It crossed the road onto the field in front of me extremely quickly, and then disappeared into an open field. I slowed right down and looked back into the field, 
It was mid-evening, so it was getting dark, but you could still see. There was nothing it could have hid behind. The grass was too short to hide in, and there was no way that any human could have ran the entire length of that field to the bush on the other side in such a short amount of time. Whatever it was, just vanished into thin air. My boyfriend told me to stop the car, but I was terrified and everything in me told me to continue driving, so I never stopped to check it out. I'm not sure whether that was a mistake or not. I don't know why it's terrified me so much, but I can't stop thinking about it and it's driving me crazy. I'm searching for an explanation. I know it may be unlikely, but has anyone else ever seen something like this? If so, do you have any idea what it was? My only explanation is something paranormal. If it were human, how did it just vanish like that? I would love to know. So here's my story. I always thought that I believed in these kinds of things, but now that it's happened to me, I'm trying my hardest to rationalize it away. Unfortunately, I can't. I just want to start off by saying that I am 37 years old, and I have never experienced anything like this in my life, and I hope never to experience it again. This happened three days ago. It was 11.30 at night, and I was taking my dog out to go to the bathroom. My boyfriend and I live on about four acres of land. We have an overgrown field in the distance. It's somewhere near the house, but not super close. I was carrying one of those spotlight flashlights. It's so powerful that you can see the beam shoot through the night sky. My dog and I were getting close to the field, so I decided to scan it with a flashlight. What I saw next still terrifies me. I saw this creature walking through the field. It had a human-shaped head, but the eyes were nothing like I had ever seen. They were so big that it took up a majority of its face. They glowed in a way that I have never seen. It was a piercing glow. I know that flashlights can create a certain type of reflective glow, but this was different. It was almost like the light was shooting out of its eyes. I live in a wooded area, so I have come into contact with many animals at night. This was not a set of eyes like I've ever seen on any animal here. It's weird because I don't recall seeing a mouth, but that could have been because I was so fixated on its abnormally large eyes that I wasn't paying attention to its lower face. Its eyes had this shocked, but evil look to them. That expression really stood out to me because it was so eerie. Now let's get to the body. It was somewhat human shape, but it had abnormally long extremities. Even though the overgrown field covered some of its body, I could still tell the shape of it. The arms were too long for its body. I checked out how tall the overgrown grass was the next day and based on that, I estimated that the creature was about six feet tall. The way it walked terrified me. It was facing me and walking sideways while staring at me. I have to admit that I got so scared I lowered the flashlight to the ground, but then I got the nerve to raise it back up after a few seconds. It had made its way down the field a little more, but it was still walking sideways and staring at me with those horrifying eyes. Needless to say, I took my dog inside after that and had a mini freak out. I've done a lot of research online and I cannot figure out what that thing was. I just know that it wasn't an animal or a human and I hope that I never see it again. This is a story from when I was growing up in Northern Kentucky in the 90s. I would have been right around 10, maybe a little older. I'm in my 30s now, but I vividly remember this happening and I still think about it all the time. 
My best friend lived with his grandparents for a bit on several acres of land in Walton, Kentucky, and I spent almost every weekend there. They never really did much with the land. It remained relatively cleared, but there were no farms or structures on it. They had a horse stable near the house, but that was it. My friend had received a go-kart for his birthday, so we were out driving it around on the open land. It was just the two of us, and we were having a blast riding this thing around. It was getting close to dusk, and we knew we were going to have to pack it in pretty soon. We came to a stop, and the engine cut out, and almost at the same time, both of us had this really strange feeling come over us. We felt like we were being watched by something. It's weird how our lizard brains can still even process something like this, but we both agreed that there was just this weird, overbearing feeling. We hadn't heard his grandpa's truck, and we were too far out to be seen from the house, so we started looking around. We were in an open field in the middle of their land, and it was surrounded by trees and tall brush. But something caught my eye first, and I got my friend to look in that same direction. In the brush, we could see a long, almost black shape sitting very still. I know at this point in the story, most of you are thinking Bigfoot. I can say I remember things being dead silent. Even now, I sometimes wonder if it was something else we saw. But all I remember is thinking that it was a giant black wolf. I would guess it was maybe 200 feet away from us. And it was sitting perfectly still. But to me anyway, it looked furry. I couldn't make out any other features, like ears or eyes. But I swear, this was what was making us feel watched. It's like when you see a cat getting ready to pounce. That's what it felt like when we were looking at this thing. We were both getting really spooked at this point. The sun was getting down low behind the tree line, and one of us was going to have to jump out and pull start the engine back up. We were whispering about what it was that was watching us. Honestly, I forget which one of us jumped out and started the cart back up, but when we looked back at where the black shape had been, it was gone. The go-kart didn't have any lights, so we drove as fast as we could back to his grandparents' house and we told them what we saw. His grandpa said we probably just saw a coyote or maybe a boar, but this shape was long and low and, I don't know, Coyote and boar, they just don't sit well in my head with what I saw. Not to mention it was pitch black and very furry. Every few years I think about this story, and I've read that there are no wolves in Kentucky anymore. I think I've just convinced myself it was a coyote or something, but the memory has stuck in my head all this time. Nothing else ever happened on his grandparents' land aside from a really bad car accident a few years later, and some missing chickens, but again, a coyote would explain that. And every once in a while, the horses would get really riled up at night. We would go camping on the land and fishing a lot, and we had a lot of fun around there. Anyway, this is my short little spooky story. I wish it had more bite to it, but it's 100% what happened. What do you think we saw? This happened a few months ago, and I've kept it to myself until recently when I told my dad about it. I was with my brother, who we'll call John, and one of our old friends. We were walking back through a forest back to where we'd come from. Since I'm younger than both of them, they tend to annoy me a lot, but this time they were being really annoying, so I decided to walk ahead. I was about halfway between them and the exit to the forest, when I heard things snapping on my left. I just brushed it off and kept walking, but then I started to hear a low mumbling noise, so I stopped and looked around. I asked if anyone was there, and I got no reply until about 30 to 40 seconds later. I heard what sounded like my brother, saying, Come here, I need your help. So I asked what was wrong while keeping my distance, because something about his voice sounded wrong. It was distorted. 
So I waited a few seconds, and then he said again, Come here, I need your help. But in the exact same way as before. So I moved to the side, and that's when I see it. It was a deer, but it was on its back legs, and its body was rigid and twisted. The worst part was that its eyes were exactly the same as mine, like a human's. I didn't believe that it was a bad creature. It actually seemed quite friendly, but nonetheless I was scared. So I ran a mile back, and the whole time I could feel it behind me. When I got out of the forest, I fell to my knees and looked back to see it disappear behind some trees. But here's the weird thing. Ever since then, I've been having bad dreams. Not about being chased by it or anything. In the dreams, I am it. So I told my dad about this, and he didn't look surprised or confused at all. He told me of a similar event he had when he was young. To this day, I remember how it felt. That was the first time that I saw it, but I doubt it will be the last. I just got home from a road trip, and I've been thinking about something I saw and can't make sense of. Maybe some of you have also seen something like this. My wife and I were driving on Highway 97 South, near Mount Shasta, California. It was about midnight, and we were driving through a heavily wooded area without any street lamps. We rounded a corner when I saw something fast and low to the ground dart across the street, about 50 to 60 yards ahead of us. I saw the glowing animal eyes, and a body that was the size and shape of a big dog. We saw animals the whole road trip, and, like usual, I asked my wife if she had seen it too, and she confirmed. The body wasn't 100% clear, because of our headlights, they hadn't reached that section of the road yet. When we got to the exact point in the road where the animal had crossed, we looked to that side to see if there was anything there. All there was, was a man dressed in army fatigues walking down the road. He didn't look at us, he just kept walking. It was pitch black and he didn't have any type of light with him. He was only illuminated by our headlights. We both got full body chills when we saw him because we were expecting to see an animal. I know that area has a magical and mystical history with a lot of unexplained sightings, but this is unlike anything I've ever experienced before. We were fully creeped out. I still can't make heads or tails of this, so I figured I'd tell you the story. Does anyone else have a story like this that happened to them? My story is nothing special, but I feel like I should write it down and tell it. It was during the summer of 2017 when my family had gone on vacation to California. We were at the end of our trip, in which we'd been driving from San Francisco to Los Angeles to catch our plane back home. We had just finished seeing John Steinbeck's family home in Salinas earlier, and we were heading back to Los Angeles. I remember us passing the golden valleys where several wineries dotted the landscape. The sun was beginning to descend, as it was some time in the mid-afternoon, possibly around four or five. We were all packed into a rental van, with most of my family members being asleep save for my dad, who was driving, my grandmother, who sat in the front with him, and myself, who was sitting in the right side of the back. As we were coming around a bend in the road, our backs to the wineries, I suddenly heard my dad say, What is that? 
Being in the back, I could only peek at his side of the van, but I definitely could make out a dark figure crossing from the left side of the road. Reasoning that I would see it in just a few seconds, I quickly darted to my side, where surely I would see whatever or whoever it was come into view. As we got closer, I saw the figure suddenly change posture from upright to walking on all fours before disappearing behind the hill we were coming around. I attempted to see if I could see it behind the hill, but to my surprise, there was nothing there. There was nowhere for it to hide, considering it was man-sized, so I was dumbfounded. My dad and I were both confused. As he was paying attention to the road, he had only seen it upright. My grandmother was more than likely zoned out, as despite being in the front, she failed to see anything. Both my dad and I believe in the paranormal, and while he believed it was a Sasquatch, I believe it could have been a skinwalker or something similar. So far, it's the only instance of the paranormal I've come across in my life, but I still think about what that might have been to this day. Deep within the wooded territories of East Brook, Maine, I had heard whispers about a creature that straddled the line between myth and reality. To some, it was just a tale used to scare misbehaving children. To others, it was a very real terror, a memory that haunted their dreams. They called it the East Brook Harpy. I had come to Maine on a whim, escaping the claustrophobia of city life and seeking solace in the embrace of nature. My rented cabin, while rustic, offered breathtaking views of the nearby forest and lake. However, as I chatted with the locals, the topic of the harpy would inevitably come up. Avoid the woods at dusk, they would warn me. Curiosity is a funny thing. Despite the warnings, or perhaps because of them, I decided to take an evening stroll in the forest. The orange and pink hues of the setting sun painted the sky, casting long, haunting shadows on the forest floor. It began innocently enough, just the sounds of the forest, the chirping of the crickets, the gentle sway of the trees. But as the sun dipped below the horizon and twilight took over, an eerie quiet enveloped the woods. Then, I heard it. A high-pitched, mournful wail that echoed through the trees. It sent shivers down my spine. Following the sound, I stumbled upon a clearing where I saw her, the Eastbrook Harpy. She was a grotesque fusion of bird and woman. Her large, tattered wings seemed too worn to hold her and yet they fluttered with an eerie grace. Her eyes were deep black pools, filled with a sorrow that was palpable. She seemed to be searching for something, or someone. Our eyes locked, and in that moment a flood of emotions washed over me. Fear, certainly, but also a deep sadness. The stories I had heard betrayed her as a malevolent spirit, but up close, she looked lost, trapped between worlds, neither fully human nor bird. The spell was broken by a sudden rustling in the trees. The harpy let out another sorrowful wail, spread her wings, and disappeared into the canopy. I hurried back to the cabin, my mind racing. Sleep eluded me that night. I lay in bed, trying to make sense of the encounter. By morning, clarity dawned. The Eastbrook Harpy wasn't a monster to be feared. She was a soul in torment, forever bound to the woods, seeking something she could never find. I left Eastbrook with a heavy heart, carrying the image of the Harpy with me. While the world is full of mysteries and legends, 
one thing became clear. Sometimes, behind the facade of a monster, lies a tragic tale, just wanting to be understood. The woods of Maine had always held a special place in my heart, ever since my family began vacationing there when I was a child. The tall pines, the craggy coastlines, and the deep sense of isolation made it the perfect escape from the pressure of everyday life. This year, I invited some friends, Mike, Sarah, and Liz, to join me on a camping trip, blissfully unaware that this particular venture would be unlike any other. We set up camp deep in the woods, far from the well-trodden tourist paths. Our campsite was idyllic, encircled by ancient trees and just a stone's throw away from a tranquil lake. We spent the day fishing, swimming, and basking in the beauty of our surroundings. As night fell, we gathered around the campfire roasting marshmallows and sharing stories. It was then that Mike, a Maine native, brought up the local legend of the Pokemoonshine Lake Monster, a serpent-like creature rumored to inhabit the depths of a lake not too far from where we were camping. It's supposed to be massive, he said, with scales like armor and eyes that glow in the dark. We all laughed it off, attributing the legend to the vivid imaginations of bored locals. But as the fire dimmed, we retreated to our tents, and the atmosphere changed. The woods, which had felt so inviting during the day, now seemed to close in around us, as if hiding secrets in the shadows. It must have been around midnight when I first heard the noise. A low rumble like something large moving through water. I unzipped my tent and peered out into the darkness, my eyes straining to adjust. There it was again, this time accompanied by a series of splashes and the sound of something heavy dragging itself along the ground. Curiosity getting the better of me, I woke up Mike and Sarah and together we grabbed our flashlights and cautiously made our way toward the lake. And there, in the water, illuminated only by the silvery glow of the moon, was an enormous serpent-like form, its scales glistening, and its eyes, two glowing orbs, fixated on us. In a state of collective shock, we scrambled back to our campsite, adrenaline coursing through our veins. Liz, roused by our hurried movements, stared at us in disbelief as we recounted what we'd seen. We need to stay in our tents until morning, Mike said, his voice tinged with a gravity I had never heard before from him. We huddled in our tents, too terrified to speak. That's when the scratching began. Slow, deliberate, and unnervingly close, like the sound of talons dragging along the canvas walls of our tents. The noise circled the campsites, stopping and starting, but always there, a maddening soundtrack to the longest night of our lives. As dawn broke, the scratching finally ceased, replaced by the familiar sounds of birdsong and rustling leaves. We emerged from our tents, visibly shaken but unharmed, our campsite untouched. Packing up as quickly as we could, we left that place, vowing never to return. And while we never spoke of that night again, the experience bonded us in a way nothing else could, a shared encounter with the unexplained, forever etched in our memories. Now, when I hear tales of cryptids or local legends, I no longer dismiss them as mere folklore. Because in the remote woods of Maine, we came face to face with something that defied explanation. 
something that turned skeptics into believers and a casual camping trip into a haunting encounter with the unknown. The forests of Maine have always been a sanctuary for me, a place where I can lose myself in the serenity of towering trees and hidden lakes. But during a late summer camping trip in one of the state's more secluded forests, that sanctuary would become the setting for an experience so bizarre it shook the very foundations of what I thought I knew about the natural world. After a day spent hiking and fishing, I settled into my campsite as night began to fall. The air was thick with the scent of pine and damp earth, and the only sounds were the gentle rustle of leaves and the distant hooting of an owl. As I sat by my campfire, engrossed in a book, I felt a sudden change in the atmosphere, a subtle but palpable shift that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. That's when I heard it a low, almost guttural growl emanating from the woods beyond the circle of firelight. I snapped my head up, scanning the darkness that surrounded me, but saw nothing. Still, the feeling of being watched, of not being alone, continued to grow. Clutching my flashlight, I decided to investigate. Guided only by the narrow beam of light, and my mounting trepidation, I moved cautiously through the trees, my senses heightened, my footsteps muffled on the forest floor. Then I saw them, eyes, two glowing orbs floating just above ground level, staring directly at me. My heart pounded as I aimed the flashlight at them, revealing a creature unlike anything I had ever seen. Covered in dark, mottled fur, it was hunched over, its long, sinewy arms almost touching the ground. But it was the creature's face that captivated me, a haunting blend of human and animal features with an almost sorrowful expression. As our eyes met, the creature let out a soft, mournful cry, a sound that echoed through the woods and seemed to reverberate within me. Suddenly, as if startled by its own vulnerability, the creature swiftly turned and disappeared into the forest, its form blending seamlessly into the darkness, leaving me alone with my shock and disbelief. I returned to my campsite, my mind racing. Had I just encountered a cryptid? One of those mythical creatures that exist on the fringes of science and folklore? My thoughts turned to local legends of the Turner Beast, a mysterious creature said to roam the Maine woods, and I wondered if what I had seen was connected to these tales. Sleep did not come easily that night, and when dawn broke, I packed up and left, driven not by fear, but by an overwhelming sense of awe and wonder. As I made my way back to civilization, I felt a profound shift in my understanding of the world, a newfound respect for the mysteries that still linger in the hidden corners of our planet. I've returned to those woods several times since that night, always with a sense of anticipation and reverence, hoping for another glimpse of the unknown. And while I have yet to encounter the creature again, the experience remains etched in my memory, a constant reminder that in the depths of the main forests, something extraordinary waits, existing in the space between legend and reality. I've always been an outdoorsy type, eager to explore every inch of the world's natural beauty. 
The main woods were no exception, and I had ventured deep into them countless times. Every now and then, locals would talk about eerie occurrences, disappearances, strange cries at night, and even whispered legends of a creature known as the Rake, an almost skeletal humanoid entity with elongated limbs and lifeless eyes. I dismissed these tales as old wives' tales, but I would soon regret my skepticism. It was late July, and I was taking a solo trek through the forest to clear my mind. The canopy of green above me was a comforting sight, and the songs of birds echoed in the distance. I'd set up camp near a creek, enjoying the solitude and the symphony of water trickling over the rocks. As darkness fell, I prepared a fire and settled into my tent, my flashlight and Swiss army knife within arm's reach, just in case. The air was unusually dense that night, thick with a tension that draped over the forest like a dark veil. I shook off the feeling and slid into my sleeping bag, dismissing it as the product of an overactive imagination. In the dead of night, a rustling outside my tent yanked me from my sleep. My heart pounded as I grabbed my flashlight, unzipping the tent just enough to poke my head out. The beam of light danced through the trees, but found nothing. Slightly relieved, I told myself it was probably just a raccoon or a squirrel, but the tension in the air still held its grip on me. I tightened the zipper and returned to sleep. Not long after, I was awakened again, this time by an unholy screech that echoed through the woods. It was a sound that defied description, like the scream of a woman combined with the roar of an animal. I felt my blood freeze, my body paralyzed with fear. As quickly as I could, I put on my boots and grabbed my knife. With a flashlight in hand, I stepped outside the tent. The forest had fallen ominously silent. Even the creek seemed to murmur more quietly, as if aware of the dread that hung in the air. I began to move cautiously, my flashlight cutting through the dark. I told myself I would investigate only a little before turning back. Just when I thought I couldn't handle any more suspense, I saw it. A figure no more than 50 feet away was hunched over, drinking water from the creek. It was skeletal, but covered in patches of skin its elongated limbs disturbingly human, yet entirely wrong. I nearly dropped my flashlight when it turned toward me, revealing hollow eyes that seemed to absorb the light. In that moment, I felt a terror that eclipsed all rational thought. My legs carried me back to my tent faster than I'd ever moved. I tore it down in record time, throwing everything into my backpack. I didn't look back until I was well away from that clearing, and even then, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was still being watched. When I finally emerged from the forest, bathed in the first light of dawn, I knew something had changed in me. The woods would never again be a sanctuary. They were now a place where nightmares could step out of the shadows and into reality. I never reported my experience knowing the ridicule and skepticism that would greet me. Even now, years later, I can't find a logical explanation for what I encountered that night. But one thing is certain. The cryptic legends of Maine's forests hold a truth far more terrifying than any tale. And whatever that creature was, it's still out there, lurking in the depths of the woods. And so I tell you this story with a warning. Be wary of the forest's edge, for beyond it might lie horrors that defy understanding.
I'm currently seeking some insight into a strange event that happened in my past. I'm hoping for possible explanations related to cryptids or paranormal phenomena, so I can understand what happened. This occurred back when I was living in Seymour, Indiana, when I was about eight or nine years old. I was spending my day at a playground located near the apartment complex where I lived. In my playtime, I distinctly heard my mom's voice calling out to me, from a direction entirely opposite to where she was at the moment. Baffled, I went to confirm that it was her, only to be told that she had not called me. I went back to playing, and I didn't hear the voice again. What puzzles me are actually a few aspects of this experience. First, my mom was situated a substantial distance away from me, probably about four or five minutes away. Yet the voice that mimicked hers seemed to come from an identical distance, but in the complete opposite direction. Secondly, I have no prior history of hallucinations in my life. I initially shared this story before, but I got more questions than answers. Hopefully somebody knows what this might be. Skinwalker doesn't seem to fit the description, at least based on what I understand, but some kind of mimicry was at play. In 2012, I found myself stationed in North Kandahar, standing guard one night just shy of midnight. My attention was drawn to some unexpected movement in a nearby rubbish heap. Initially, it seemed to be just a dog rummaging around, but to my astonishment, it rose on its hind legs and walked away nonchalantly in a disturbingly human manner. Fear gripped me. Upon inquiring from the local villagers, we were told that it was a yeti, part of a family that had resided in a nearby cave. They ominously shared how these creatures occasionally kidnapped and ate villagers. The chill that ran down my spine at this translation was palpable, and it was clear I wasn't the only one affected. This spectacle was witnessed by everyone in our combat outpost, or COP and it earned the humorous moniker, Man Bear Pig. Although we all laughed it off, when the opportunity arose to track the creature, no volunteers stepped forward. One midnight, as I was about to drift off to sleep on my cot, the crackle of gunfire from the Afghan army side of the camp startled me awake. Accompanied by the master sergeant, we quickly armed ourselves and went to investigate the commotion. The Afghani soldiers explained they had spotted the Yeti and opened fire, but it had managed to escape. The master sergeant turned to me and proposed, with a jovial glint in his eye, You want to rally the troops and hunt this creature down? We could become famous. I simply shook my head in silent refusal. We shared a chuckle and retreated back to our cots leaving the Yeti to its nightly escapades. Skinwalker Screams A few years ago, I was taking part in a church camp. We were sleeping in tents on a wide area that was surrounded by a deep forest. The next village was far away, and it was dark as heck at night without any city light shining in the distance. It always had a kind of eerie feeling, but I didn't think much of it, until this happened. The restrooms of our camp were pretty far from our tents, on the exact opposite of the campsite. So, if I needed to go to the bathroom at night, I would have to grab a flashlight, get out of my tent, and walk across the whole area of grass and dirt. One night, I needed to pee, so I shook a friend of mine awake and asked if she could go with me to the bathroom. I was really afraid as we both got out of the tent and started walking. It was deadly silent, 
The only thing we could hear was the sound of the river nearby. We got to the bathroom, and as we left a couple of minutes later, I couldn't get to our tent fast enough. As we were halfway across the land, my heart froze. I could have sworn that it had gotten even more silent out than it was before. That's when we heard it. An absolutely horrible scream, inhuman, filled with dread and sorrow. It didn't sound like some kind of animal. It was so loud that we both jumped a little. It came right out of the dark forest, far away, but so loud that it felt like it was right beside me. It even echoed a couple of times until it vanished. Then the insects began to make noises again. My friend and I were terrified and ran for our lives. I hadn't slept that night, not even a little. I covered my ears like crazy, too afraid of what I might hear if I listened. I don't know if anybody else has experienced something like that. The only thing I've ever come across online is skinwalker screams, and they sounded just like that. I've had paranormal experiences before, but since I'm familiar with working with spirits and stuff, those I know how to handle, but this scream sends shivers down my spine to this day, and I still don't have any explanation for it. I never thought that Wendigos were a thing in Germany, but maybe they are? I really don't know. I've been camping my entire life. Deserts, mountains, forests. I thought I'd seen it all. But Maine offered a different kind of solitude. An untouched landscape dotted with old Native American rock paintings that promised more than just a weekend away. It offered an opportunity to truly test myself. The challenge was simple. Survive a week in the deep woods with minimal supplies. Day one passed without a hitch. I set up a basic camp, caught some fish, and started a fire. As the evening wore on, I admired the rock paintings near my campsite. Figures of men and animals, but also of winged creatures that looked almost divine. That night, something changed. I woke up to find my camp disturbed. My food supply was nearly gone. Had it been an animal? Or perhaps another camper? But no, I was miles away from the nearest trail. A feeling of unease settled over me. On the second night, it happened again, but this time, I heard flapping wings and thunderous cries that shook the ground. Frightened, I clutched my knife and peered into the darkness. Nothing. By the third day, exhaustion was setting in, yet a curious feeling of anticipation overwhelmed me. I found more rock paintings. These depicted what looked like a giant bird locked in combat with human warriors. Thunderbird, the legend said, a powerful spirit creature of Native American folklore. On the final night, I heard the flapping wings again. This time, they were louder, closer. Summoning my courage, I stepped out of my tent and looked up. What I saw was magnificent and terrifying. A colossal bird, its feathers shimmering with an ethereal glow, its eyes like burning coals. It circled above me, and then, with a powerful cry that echoed through the woods, disappeared into the night sky. Morning light revealed no evidence of my nocturnal visitor, but the feeling of awe remained. I had completed the challenge, but I realized the true test was not of my survival skills, but of my ability to face the unknown, to coexist with something greater than myself. As I packed up, I felt a newfound sense of respect, not just for nature, but for the ancient myths and legends that had lived long before me. I walked away from that week not just as a camper, 
but as someone who had been touched by something far older and far more mysterious than I had ever imagined. And so I left the forest, a place that had frightened yet enlightened me, knowing that the legend of the Thunderbird was real, at least for those willing to look beyond the veil of the ordinary world. I decided to go on a solo camping trip in the woods of Eastbrook, Maine. I have been going through some stuff recently and figured that nature would be the perfect escape. I did my research, chose a site, and packed my gear. I was aware of some local legends about the Eastbrook Harpy, but I figured it was all folklore, something to spook the kids. I set up camp in a secluded spot pretty far from the nearest road. The first day was wonderful. I hiked, cooked some food over a fire, and watched the stars come out. As night fell, I crawled into my tent and settled in for a peaceful sleep. Then I heard it. Around midnight, the forest erupted into this blood-curdling scream. It wasn't an animal. I know what bears and coyotes sound like. This was something else. Something human, but twisted. I grabbed my flashlight and unzipped the tent a bit to take a look. What I saw next will haunt me forever. About 50 feet away, illuminated by the moonlight, was this figure. It looked like a woman, but her eyes were glowing a faint yellow. Her arms were elongated, with fingers that were way too long. And then she opened her wings. Yes, wings. Feathered, massive, and horrifying. She let out another scream, and then soared upward, disappearing into the tree canopy. I was paralyzed with fear. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. As soon as the sun came up, I packed my things and hightailed it out of there. The thing is, when I got back to my car, there were scratch marks all over it like something had tried to get in. I've done some digging since I got home, and I found old newspaper articles about sightings of the Eastbrook Harpy. The descriptions match what I saw. This thing has been spotted by locals for decades. I don't know what's out there, and I can't explain what I saw, but I know I won't be going back into those woods alone. I'm even considering selling my camping gear. Be careful out there. You never know what's lurking in the woods. In the vast wilderness of Maine, home to ancient forests and sprawling lakes, there exists a legend that has fascinated adventurers and locals alike for generations. The legend of Pomola. Said to be a creature with the body of a man, the head of a moose, and the wings and talons of an eagle, Pomola is believed to reside near Mount Katahdin, the highest peak in the state. Tales of encounters with this mythic being have been whispered around campfires, leaving an impression on the collective psyche of the region. Driven by a mix of skepticism and insatiable curiosity, I decided to embark on a journey to investigate this elusive figure. Equipped with a backpack containing essential gear, thermal camera, voice recorder, and basic survival tools, I set forth toward Mount Katahdin, a formidable entity rising against the backdrop of Maine's wilderness. As I trekked through the dense forest, my boots sinking slightly into the mossy ground, I couldn't help but feel the weight of the landscape around me. The trees seemed like ancient guardians, and the wind whispered secrets only they were privy to. It was as if the entire forest was holding its breath, anticipating something profound. I finally reached a vantage point near the base of Mount Katahdin as the sun dipped below the horizon. 
The fading light cast long shadows that danced in the chill of the approaching night. I set up my thermal camera and initiated the voice recorder. If you're out there, Pamola, I mean no harm. I simply wish to understand. I spoke softly into the recorder, the words almost freezing in the icy air. For what felt like an eternity, there was silence, save for the distant rustle of leaves and the occasional howl of a far-off wolf. Then, out of nowhere, a cacophonous roar shattered the tranquility. My thermal camera picked up a rapid fluctuation in temperature, registering a form that was neither wholly animal nor completely human. For a brief second, my eyes met what I can only describe as a visage melding moose and man, framed by expansive feathered wings. Just as suddenly as it appeared, the figure vanished into the looming darkness of the mountain, leaving behind an unnerving silence and a sense of awe that gripped my very core. I collected my equipment and retreated, my footsteps quickening with each yard, a newfound respect for the legend filling my thoughts. In the days that followed, I examined the data and recordings which offered no conclusive evidence, no photographs, no ground-breaking EVPs. Yet the experience itself became a different form of evidence, a haunting reminder that legends often contain kernels of truth folded into the fabric of the places they inhabit. I have yet to return to Mount Katahdin, but the legend of Pamola remains etched in my memory, a spectral presence that defies explanation yet demands reverence. Whether it's a guardian spirit of the mountain, a cryptid, or a mere figment of collective folklore, I cannot say. But what is clear is that in the shadowed corners of Maine's wilderness, Mystery and wonder are alive, compelling us to question the boundaries of our understanding and to respect the ancient stories that ripple through the land. Hiking the Appalachian Trail had been my dream for as long as I could remember. The stretch that passes through Maine was said to be both the most beautiful and the most challenging, so I saved it for last. With my trusty backpack and hiking boots, I set off, my heart filled with excitement and a little bit of dread. I made good progress the first day covering a significant distance as the dense main woods wrapped around me like an emerald embrace. It was during the second day that I stumbled upon the strange artifact, an odd-shaped rock with mysterious carvings, half buried in the ground. I didn't recognize the symbols, but they fascinated me enough to keep it as a keepsake. By nightfall of the third day, I began hearing them, the footsteps, soft but deliberate, keeping pace with me but always remaining unseen. I told myself it was just an animal, but I knew better. The footprints I found the next morning confirmed it. They were human, but much larger, almost unnaturally so. That's when I remembered an old Maine legend about the specter moose, an albino moose that was not just an animal, but a spirit of the forest. It was said to appear in times of great change, a harbinger of things to come. On the fourth night, I saw it. Under the moonlight, the specter moose revealed itself. It was an incredible sight, larger than any moose I had ever seen, its white fur almost glowing in the dark. But what struck me the most were its eyes. They looked almost human, filled with a wisdom that seemed to transcend time. It gestured with its head, as if inviting me to follow. I hesitated, but then thought of the artifact in my pocket. Could it be related? Compelled to find out, I followed the specter moose deeper into the woods. It led me to a clearing 
where the moonlight revealed another set of carvings, similar to the ones on the artifact. It was a story depicting coexistence between humans and the forest, and a warning against disrupting the natural balance. As I touched the carvings, the artifact in my pocket seemed to resonate, vibrating gently as if to acknowledge its twin. The specter moose looked at me one last time, its gaze almost approving, before vanishing into the forest. I resumed my hike the next day, but something had changed. The trail was the same, the challenge as demanding as ever, but I was different. I had walked into the woods as a lone hiker, chasing a dream. I walked out with the weight of revelation that were all part of a larger, connected system, forever bound by the stories that shape us. I left the artifact back where I found it, deciding that some things are better left untouched, their mysteries free to captivate the next wanderer brave enough to venture into the deep main woods. Eastbrook, a quaint town tucked away in Maine, has always intrigued me with its rich lore and the tales of the enigmatic Eastbrook harpy. According to local folklore, this cryptid is a blend of woman and bird, with the ability to emit a wail that freezes even the bravest hearts. I decided to venture into the Maine woods, armed with a camera, a voice recorder, and a compass determined to unravel the truth behind the harpy myth. The woods exuded a mystical atmosphere. Old growth trees loomed high above their branches, woven into intricate patterns that seemed to obscure the sky. The forest floor was a quiet orchestra of rustling leaves and hidden life. Despite the picturesque setting, a sense of foreboding seeped through, as though the forest itself was warning me of what lay ahead. It wasn't long before I reached a clearing, believed by locals to be a hot spot for harpy sightings. With bated breath and beating heart, I set up my makeshift base, placing the voice recorder in the middle of the clearing and setting the camera to capture any movement. Is anyone here? I asked into the void my voice somehow managing to pierce the heavy silence. Nothing. Just the whispering wind and the distant hoot of an owl. If you're the Eastbrook Harpy, can you give me a sign? And then it happened. A scream unlike any I had ever heard ripped through the forest air. A melding of human agony and avian screech. My camera trembled in my hands as I aimed it toward the source of the sound. For a brief moment, I saw it. A figure, half woman, half bird, perched atop a tree. Its eyes glowed a fierce yellow, and a spread of feathers framed its form. The entity took flight, disappearing into the canopy of trees, but not before it left me with a sense of existential dread, a reminder of my fragility in a world filled with unknowns. I collected my equipment, my hands shaking, and made my way out of the woods, each step weighed down by the energy of what I had just experienced. As I reviewed the footage days later, I found that the camera had malfunctioned at the critical moment, turning my tangible evidence into nothing more than a personal anecdote tinged with the supernatural. I've never returned to those woods, but the experience lingers like a haunting melody, a brush with an entity or a legend that refused to be captured, but left its mark nonetheless. Whether the Eastbrook Carpy is real or just a figment of collective imagination, I can't say. What I do know is that some mysteries are woven so deeply into the fabric of a place that they become inseparable from it, part of the pulse that makes each leaf quiver and every shadow dance. And sometimes, 
those mysteries find a way to reveal themselves, if only for a fleeting moment, in ways that leave us questioning the boundaries of what we consider to be real.